of interest. Any member wish to declare any interest that isn't already recorded in the agenda? No? Items of public consultation. Ms. Michelle Condico would like to speak, I believe, on items 6, 7, 8 and 9. Maybe. Possibly. Yeah, because I didn't have any of the documents. So I would wait the RMD. Move on to item six, provision of hospice beds. Thank you. Hello, hello everybody. I'd like to introduce my colleague Debbie Martin. Um, you can see where we're from on our name boards. And our colleague Jenny was meant to be with us from the CCG, but she'll see when we get met. Um, so uh, some of you will have met me, I think about six months ago, when you asked me to come and talk about hospice beds then. And I gave you a bit more than hospice beds then and you asked me to come back in about six months' time. So I'm going to start with some real good news, which was the rapid response service that I mentioned we were planning at the last meeting. Um, that service is a pilot project for 18 months, and the funding for that service has come from the hospice and from our colleagues, the South Warwickshire Foundation Trust. Um, it is an at-night service, and it is for everybody across the whole of North Warwickshire, Nuneaton and Bedworth. So we went live on the 1st of November with our joint team and in January alone we made 96 visits to people across North Warwickshire, so that's an average of three people at home getting a visit each night. And in the first three months we did 219 visits in total to 99 people across uh, Warwickshire North and 18 people were supported to actively die at home and we're delighted that 99.7 of people are being visited within 30 minutes of their call through to the service. So the service also includes all the care homes, both nursing and residential across the area. Our main reason for visiting is to provide symptom control and management and also give carer reassurance and support and our term of last offices so when somebody actually dies we can support the family with what's needed to be done at that point in time getting lots of praise already. I'm going to hand over to Debbie shortly. She's going to share some of that with you. We have a really simple referral process. You pick up the phone and you ring the team and you get through directly so families can speak immediately to the professional staff that we've got providing the service. We're getting feedback from our colleagues at George Elliott Hospital that their frail and elderly patients and families are more confident to let them go back home or into care homes from the hospital knowing that that service is there overnight to support them. Um, we believe that we have prevented at least five people going into hospital. That's a very subjective thing to establish, but that's our service um, team's feel. We know that we have prevented 12 999 ambulance calls, and we have prevented 126 calls to the out-of-hours service. Um, we've got some key performance indicators agreed with our clinical commissioners, and we're just really hopeful that we'll be able to demonstrate mm -hmm. our worth, enabling people to remain at home and in their care homes, and ultimately out of hospital, saving money and enabling people's care preferences to be achieved. 
and I'm going to ask Debbie to share some options of feedback so you can hear what people are saying about it. Thank you. Um, so I've got three pieces of feedback and I'm happy to read out to you any ones that you want. In, in South Warwickshire Foundation Trust at the beginning of January we had our CQC inspection and whilst um, myself and the members of the rapid response team were there talking to CQC she said oh I've just had um, some correspondence from a family so I've got some feedback from the CQC they shared the letter that um, she'd received I've got um, a letter from a GP but also a letter from Powell's um, which compliments George Elliott as well as Mary Ann Evans and South Warwickshire Foundation Trust and the rapid response team so I'm happy if you let me know which one you want me to read out Members got any preferences? Thank you. So it says I'm writing to share some positive feedback we received from this. Sorry, that was from the CQC. So they're writing to share this positive feedback from the family of a patient um, in North Warwickshire. And the feedback was: having recently lost our father to cancer, we feel the need to write and praise the professionalism and care and support we receive from the hospice at home and the rapid response teams um, from Mary Ann Evans. Our father had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's the year before his diagnosis of terminal multiple myeloma. As he had Alzheimer's disease, it was particularly important to us that he be cared for in the familiar surroundings of his own home. Without the fantastic teams from the hospice, we're not sure that this would have been achieved. Colleagues who do not live in the North Warwickshire area have tried and failed to care for their loved ones at home, largely because of the long delays at night in their loved ones receiving the necessary drugs and pain relief for distress. Watching prolonged pain and distress resulting in them putting in their relatives into care of hospices and hospitals. We feel particularly blessed that during the very isolating nighttime hours, if our father needed medication, a call to the rapid response team meant the necessary drugs were delivered in a timely manner, controlling our father's distress. The team also delivered much encouragement and support to both of us at this particularly difficult time. It saddens us that this service is not available in all of the areas of the UK and felt the need to make you aware of just how valuable this service is. Keeping our father at home not only meant a better experience for all of us, but I'm sure was also valuable in keeping a hospice or hospital bed free for those who are not fortunate enough to have a family who can provide care. We do hope this rapid response service not only continues in North Warwickshire, but also becomes available to everyone caring for a terminally ill person at home, and we cannot express just how vital the service is. So, as I say, that's one of the feedbacks that we've had, and also we've just, at, it's fair to say a draft form, aren't we, but just putting together a poster um, sharing some of the statistics that Kate talked about so that we can circulate this across North Warwickshire as well, just detailing the service that we've got, but as I say, it's in draft form, but hopefully you'll see that everywhere. And going to conferences as well so that we can share what we're doing uh, on, on a wider national level too, and locally. Um, really good timing because our next little slot was going to be about the end of life beds and an update for you on that and Jenny's now joined us and then I just wanted a little update with that dying matters because you said you wanted to hear about that and I wanted to tell you what we're doing this year. Jenny, you happy yes, to thank you. So apologies I was um, late. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so we've been working very collabor um, collaboratively with um, with hospices and with the um, other providers through the um, collaboration network and I presume you've kind of already given them that sort of back Right. Not really. no. oh, okay. <laughs> so basically what we did was we've established um, a, a group that meets very, very regularly um, and the ask of that group was people to come together to look at what um, contribution the different partners were making towards end of life care and how we could actually take those contributions and to network them and wire them together better within the resources that we've got available and potentially also free up some resources differently to try some new and innovative ways of working with um, with new partners um, and one of, the, one of the schemes that's come out of that is the, the rapid res response um, initiative um, and you've already heard some of the um, patient stories but also what I would say is our GP practices have also written and for GP practices at the moment to put pen to paper to write to say how great the service it is, is, is really quite something. Um, and um, and also the therefore the sort of the, 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 the level of um, care and support but also the 
the genuine sense of partnership that's been wrapped around the, the individual's care. So that's been really, really positive. So in addition to that as a CCG, we've um, started to, we've got two other initiatives that have been linked into the work that we've been doing. One is around um, looking to enhance some um, specific beds arrangements, bedded care arrangements for people with end of life and this really came out of a concern that um, particularly in the more rural north there was not necessary access to that opportunity and that there was um, provision in Coventry but that didn't necessarily mean that people could be cared for closer to home and obviously for patients that want to see their relatives and keep, um, keep that connectivity that was a concern. So we, we looked at uh, the options around that um, and um, there is a limited amount to what I can say in terms of the provider because we are in a mini procurement process at the moment. But I'm pleased to say that we've um, agreed to fund four additional non-complex um, beds with wraparound additional support um, for um, end of life care patients um, and we hope to have that secured very, very soon um, and that will will provide an additional offer into the system over and above the rapid response and over and above the other sort of um, care options available for individuals. In addition to that as well we've recently agreed um, a um, piece of work with our GPs to support them to um, uh, facilitate the um, care management of patients with um, end of life to ensure that they're on the register, they're identified um, and therefore the um, services that are available for them are wrapped around the care and also there's integrated working with the various different providers. So one of the issues has always been the choices that people are making in terms of end of life care, in terms of where they want to um, have spend their last days of life. Um, um, that do not resuscitate um, uh, um, components and also that, that all partners involved in the care are aware of, the, of, of those care needs and um, this programme of work that we've been doing with GPs will uh, enable um, GPs to have a particular specific register and be able to work proactively with those, with those care plans. So those are two specific developments in relation to primary care and the, and the beds that have been taken forward and it should be seen not as an isolated piece of work in the context of linking in with the rapid response and, some, and the existing provision in terms of specialist nurses for end of life that are commissioned through the community services contract as well. So that's the pattern and the package of care and some of the enhancements that have been made recently. And just very quickly for Dying Matters, I, I mentioned that we do this every year and Dying Matters Week is the 14th to 20th of May this year and we've decided as a core cool group of providers, um, our Swift colleagues, our fractional CCG, the hospices and George Elliott, we're going to take a very different approach. So we're working with a number of the King Edward College students um, and that's going to enable us to have exposure to work with a group of people that we wouldn't normally work with, which automatically raises awareness to issues around death and dying. These young people, obviously friends get killed in car accidents or their parents or siblings may die, but they're not the common group that we would normally work with directly. Um, so we are finding that quite challenging, but in a positive way, and we're all learning <coughs> together. So the students are from the art group, the media, the drama and journalism and they're seeking to develop their skills and do some of their project work to help raise awareness to dying matters. And the arts students, for example, wish to spend some time with the hospice patients and then portray that person's life in a piece of art, probably a piece of canvas art. And Pure Jim in the Neaton are actively considering um, exhibiting the artwork for us during Dying Matters Week, but that isn't confirmed yet, they're just considering it. So that's another opportunity to take the issue externally into an environment that you wouldn't normally see something about death and dying in. And, and that's it from us. So the only thing I just wanted to add is that in terms of care as well, oh, yes. there's, there's, there's been um, a piece of work that again we're looking at collaboratively with um, carers advocacy groups and we've designed some materials um, uh, through that collaboration in terms of um, additional sort of support and signposting for carers um, and also obviously the rapid response piece sort of plays into the carers work as well 
Um, and one of the things that we're exploring is what education, training, support and resilience um, can be offered to carers because obviously um, despite all the wraparound stuff that we're putting in place and the response has been more rapid, carers still remain key to the, the support of, of this patient of cohort um, and so that's another area that we're taking <coughs> up and I think we'll launch into the, um, the, the Dome Matters yeah. piece as well because obviously that's very much about understanding the conversations and, and, and the impact on carers as well. So that I think is it. Mrs. Colby, do you wish to speak on the phone? No, I don't think there's anything to add. Thank you. Do, do members, Councillor Marvin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, can I thank Debbie, Kay, and, and Jenny for coming to speak to us today? Uh, and also, I would hope all this committee would agree that we'd like to thank, pass on our thanks to all of your staff and the staff who work in this area because they're very brave and they do very difficult but beautiful and rewarding job and we're very grateful to them. Um, I originally raised the issue of hospice beds and asked for it to come to this committee because one of the problems that lots of residents experience is that there are or were beds in Warwick or Leamington or further afield in Warwickshire and also there wasn't the support at home and really if you're in Leamington and Bedworth uh, that really is very challenging for you. You've already got a very difficult time losing a loved one. You don't want to be uh, travelling over to Warwick and Leamington, which is impossible. Uh, and so I want to thank you for the work that's been developed over, over the last few years and uh, telling us about it today. What, what I'm interested in is, first of all, what us as a council could do. And I'm interested in dying matters and how we could support some of that work chair, uh, possibly, uh, in relation to just publicising materials, uh, because we do come in to touch with the bereaved. Uh, and this isn't, you know, there are lots of political arguments we can have <coughs> outside of this matter about politics and uh, funeral costs and all of those things, but on this matter I think we should all be coming together uh, and work with those who are bereaved that we come into contact with. We've already developed in this council uh, a one-stop uh, opportunity for people to report that a loved one has passed away, and that informs other services. But when we come into contact with people, it might be useful for us to pass on information that could help individuals. Finally, in relation to the hospice beds, I know you mentioned North Warwickshire, and North Warwickshire is a big place, and I appreciate you spoke about rural. I wonder whether any of those beds potentially could be in the Neaton and Bedworth, and if not, what we could do over the coming years, and I understand budget difficulties, really to get those beds in the Neaton and Bedworth. Now it may be hospice at home is actually fulfilling that, and there isn't a requirement, but it may be some people don't want to die at home, but they don't want to die in a hospital ward uh, that's not catering for their needs, so you need a mix. So I just wonder what we could do over the next few years to support you in your work and what was potentially in the pipeline. Okay. <coughs> There's quite a few things there, wasn't there? So um, in terms of your ask of what you could, you, you could do, I do think that um, the um, Dying Matters um, um, opportunity um, is something that um, it would be great to, we, you know, as a council, you're a big employer, um, you know, same as we are as providers, and if you think about all the services you commission as well um, through through that route, um, if if there was some real sign up to the Don't Matters campaign and getting involved in those conversations, because the other thing is as well is that we'll probably. Um, you, you know, we've, we've probably got a number of staff that are going through some of those sorts of experiences or have been through those experiences. So there's also that whole sort of network of, of people saying, you know, this is what helped me and this is what I found useful and that word of mouth sort of peer support and creating a sort of groundswell of that kind of support I think would be would be fantastic if we could um, harness har harness that act. Um, and sorry, Jane, there is a, a website that you can go on to just for Dying Matters and there's loads of downloadable material yeah. material plus and minus you can purchase some. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. That, so again, so us being um, sort of clear, uh, clear about that I think would be sort of, sort of really helpful. Um, 
and and I suppose the dying matters is it should be about a launch pad for the conversation and it's about how we continue that conversation so it doesn't just become an annual thing it, it's about sort of and again if we were to do that through our our staffing our networks and, and organizations I think that that could come create, create some real um, momentum so that would be something that, that I would suggest um I think that um that people being aware of the services that we've described is really important because obviously the council again has staff that, that you will be working that will come into contact with people whether that be because of continuing health care or whether it's because <coughs> of, you know, they're working residential homes or they work in um, high dependency um, uh, residential components that sort of thing so just being aware of what the services are out there because um, signposting is something that's really important and you can it, websites and portals are all great and we should absolutely optimise those but there is nothing like a personal recommendation there is nothing like a personal recommendation so that sort of whole sort of I've experienced it I've felt it this was my experience or something that so again if we can kind of create that sort of um, sort of passing on the message um, <coughs> would be, um, I think something that, that But any other ideas that you, you have or any other suggestions, we'd be glad to, to pick them up. And I think the other point, and that's the whole point about doing the young people's piece of work, is that we do still tend to look at end of life as an, as a, an age-related issue. And of course it is in, to some degree, <coughs> but it isn't, it isn't the exclusive parameters of somebody over a certain age. And actually some of the isolation issues potentially for young carers and people that, that are younger that are experienced that um, and the impact on, on, on their ability to go to work and go back to work is actually quite significant. So so all of those sorts of issues would be a really useful <coughs> concept to have. Um, the beds bit, shall I pick that, <laughs> that up specifically? So we specifically targeted the rural north in the, in the rural north in the first instance because that's where we where we looked at some of the data and some of the specific gaps and the specific um, areas of con of concern. But the issue really is to identify um, how this particular additional offer fits with the rest of the of, of the work that we're doing. And the intention was always to look at what the demand profile might be and if we need and if it works and it's supportive and people feel that and there is an appetite for that to look at other sort of other options and whether that would then for for the Neaton Bedworth area be <coughs> a, a similar model in terms of links with nursing homes with background care or whether it would be something a different offer that's yet to be understood. Um, but um, so at we're not seeing these specific beds necessarily being the end of the story. I can't guarantee when and what there would be and how many and where because I think we just need to understand that demand profile. Um, and also, um, as we've said, with, with individuals that, that are experiencing end of life, there are a range of other services that are provided, and I don't want to get too technical, but there's things that, that we, we call um, D2A pathways around um, uh, pathways of care that's rapid. Um, um, <coughs> the, the, the ripple pathway the, the and, and discharge, and the dis di discharge support. So in order to understand all of that, we need to sort of put that together. So what I would say is, at the moment our focus was there because that's where we identified the initial um, need. We've got the wraparound, which is new, and we're looking at what other things we invest in that touch people with end of life provision and <coughs> how anything additional would map onto that, fit with that, rather than being either a duplication or, or, or complicating things. But and we are in, and that's exactly why the collaborative uh, meeting that we're having is an ongoing meeting because it, it's a very it's a very live discussion. And it's it's a meeting where people come to it to say, this is what's going on. We could do this. Could we tweak that? Could we do this slightly different? I'm having those conversations, and it's an ongoing meeting, and I think that's the, that's what's so fantastic about that, that group of people that are working together. So that's where we are with the with the beds. And I've got a feeling there's something else that I've completely missed. No, no, I think that was everything. Oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's lots of positive things there, and clearly an understanding around other 
support, you know, for that, those people that are supporting the people that are in need, they need their own support as well. Um, <coughs> so I'm pretty well uh, reassured about the initiatives that are, are coming on board, um, but still have some concerns I've got to say, because it, it's going to be difficult resolving, resolving it, it all. Um, and if I give an example, is, um, I have a friend who's terminally ill. Uh, that person was recently offered a hospice bed, but in Tamworth. Mm. And it's not much good to somebody that lives in Nuneaton and Bedworth, you know, to be given a, a place in, in Tamworth. <coughs> um, having said that, uh, because uh, that person declined that <coughs> offer because of obvious reasons, um, the the information and support that they've been given in, and I think they've made the decision now to, to die at home, um, <coughs> has been has been excellent. Um, but regardless of where these beds may or may not be, it's my, one an old chestnut of mine. People have heard me say it many times, really. Is it's maybe not so bad for the person that's using the bed or getting the treatment. And I apply this across all of the health service, really. But you need the support of your friends and family. Mm -hmm. And if your friends and family can't travel to see you, it's a real issue. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> I, I actually I understand the, the the reasoning about the rural area, but I think. Uh, being an area such as Nuneaton and Bedworth and all the health issues that apply to it, which in, in many cases don't apply to a lot of rural areas and particularly in the south of the county, I think you know we, we're ab absolutely desperate for some local, um, local hospice type bed provision. Yes, and the, and I, I'll just... Um, I'll just finish off by, I was interested in all the various links with different people and organisations, but one that I didn't hear you mention, and I think it's a <coughs> really good uh, thing, is the death cafes. Yes, I know they sound, it no, sounds a, a, a terrible thing. No, we've done them for the last three years, so yeah, we decided I'll this year to try something different. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Yeah, probably come back again, but we, we wanted to, yeah. we didn't think the youngsters would appreciate us going in with a let's do a good death cafe together. We have obviously used the language about death and dying, but yeah. we're trying to approach it a slightly different but, way. Um, funnily enough, I was listening to something on the radio this morning where they actually set a death cafe up mm -hmm. within a university, mm -hmm. and I can see options for us doing that at, say, you know, at Nuneaton College or, or, or other places at some point. Yeah, I mean, having spoken with the young people personally myself, you have to be very <coughs> careful around the language that you're using and um, at the hospice we have a bit of a rule that we don't use the words passed away, lost, slipped on, gone over the bridge. We always try and say death or yeah. dying and that can be quite offensive and difficult but um, I think I managed it okay and the students have invited me back now three times so I'm obviously doing all right there. Um, but I personally didn't feel comfortable going straight in with let's do a good death cafe together. I've made them aware about what we've done historically, so I haven't shied away from telling them about the good death cafe. But equally, I didn't want to go in telling the students what we wanted them to do. I wanted to talk to them about dying matters, what it tried to achieve, and then get them to come up with their ideas of how they could contribute to that and support us with that piece of work. So that, that's what we've tried to do. Yeah, no, that's it's okay. just different. So I mean, just just to conclude, but you could do it, one. It's a, it's <laughs> a, it, you know, there's lots of good things there, but I mean, no doubt we need some yeah. some beds locally. So um, I mean, as 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 I said, we're in the process at the moment of commissioning those 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 four four beds, um, and we are already we still continue to have conversations through the collaborative network in terms of the other sort of opportunities that we need to explore. Um, I can't tell you exactly where those beds are going to be at this point in time because we're in we're in that process and we will put quality and the requirements for the right, right environment first. Um, so we will be looking at that. Um, and there are, you know, there, there, 
whilst there are a number of providers, there are only a number of providers in a particular area that we would consider to be have the right environment and the right skills to do that. So we'll be looking at, at that um, and and also as an option. So I've heard your message and we definitely need to do that. And with the rapid response piece um, as well, we'll support that. Um, because you're absolutely right, it's about the quality of care that somebody has and the choices that they have and the opportunity to have a look at to work through those choices. In terms of the Good Death Cafe um, thing, um, just to say that obviously for, for Dying Matters we're taking this particular approach but alongside that there are a number of our PPG groups that are actually going to be doing some um, of, some of their initiatives that relate to uh, Dying Matters Week etc. Um, and some of uh, and that's obviously a different cohort of, of, of people um, and they are looking at, at, at um, organising similar sorts of conversations in terms of um, uh, de Good Death Cafe type um, networking. And the other thing I wanted to say is this isn't specifically to um, uh, end of life, but we've recently been working very closely with um, an organisation, um, Age UK, um, and doing a, a, a navigator support, um, which has been wrapping around practices. And um, one of the things that we've picked up through that is the invaluable work that they're doing. Um, when people do have a bereavement in terms of working with people that then feel very isolated um, or as a consequence of caring for somebody um, their own health needs have been compromised or supported and um, <coughs> health navigators are, it's one of the areas where we've, we've sought to make those links so that there's the support for the, for the individuals and it's not done as a carer support but it's done more practically in terms of you know, my income's changed, you know, what am I going to do with the house, um, I feel very, really, very isolated, you know, and also the simple sense that people feel sometimes are so focused on their carer role that actually once that individual has died, their purpose and role in life changes and so their, their support needs to change. So we're also doing that piece of work because we often find that that's a time when some of those carers that have, have been bereaved suddenly tip up at the GP when they haven't tipped up previously and it's not necessarily always a, a health issue it's more of those those sorts of issues so there's lots and lots of things that need to be wired together and networked together as a package of support for, for both the bereaved and, and the and the individuals that are going through that journey. I think the only thing I'd like to add is that the hospice is working very alongside the CCG on anything that they're doing with the bedside of provision because we are very committed to the same issues that you're raising um, but we don't have an absolute endless bottomless pit of money so we're trying to work together in different ways to um, make these things happen the best way we can and, and I would just say as a committee <coughs> that would be one of the one of the real um, learning points and benefits of coming out of this what we have done with work is we've done it as a collaboration as a partnership about what's possible and what could be done rather than sometimes when we commission something we say this is what we want, this is what you're going to provide, and we don't actually have those conversations. It's been a very different approach, and the providers have come to the table saying, it's not all going to be about money, it's about how can we do things differently, and we've come to the table that says, we know that you might need different things, but what can we tweak and how can we do that? And I think that has been, that, that for me, it has been a real revelation of a different approach to, to taking forward a piece of work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's so much pressure the NHS is under at the moment, and particularly I'm on a working group at the county look at GPs. So the more we can actually take work that's more specialised and needs, it, it isn't necessarily a job for the GP, the stuff that you're doing, uh, and it's really good you're doing it. So I'd like to know how we can make it last more than 18 months, how we get it to carry on. Um, yeah, the, it may, obviously has a massive benefit for the hospitals as well in terms of not having those five people or however many mm -hmm. come in. Um, and also how we can replicate this to a wider area so that so A, it becomes more sustainable because it, it's having an even bigger impact so you can measure it better. Uh, and one thing that always keeps getting told is about 30% of the people at George Eliot actually come from Hinckley and Bosworth as well. So if you're doing marvellous stuff here, um, that's actually freeing up beds and e easing up the um, dying process and doing all these benefits, it might be worth just sort of asking across the border um, have, have they thought of rapid response and um, yeah, it's, 
I mean, they've got the same distance problems as going out to Norfolk, which was going north into Hinkley, and obviously north of Hinkley, I mean, to get to Walsgrave is getting the same sort of problems. So it, it, it'd be great if this sort of got copied uh, and actually then had a bigger quantifiable gain. You could actually wave. So. And just in terms of continuation, I mean, we've, we've, we've always said that the important thing is about <coughs> the quality and the service to the patient and the collaboration and working together, um, and that we want to try and do what we can do with that ethos and then always look at the money and how we do it, which is why it's been different. But in terms of continuation, that we've got a bigger, broader piece of work that we're doing with um, the hospice providers and, and SWIFT around community services out of hospital anyway, and this programme of work will fir firmly sit within that programme of work. And part of the whole concept of that is about looking at how care can be coordinated around the individuals precisely to um, alleviate pressure on people go avoidable admissions, but also in terms of alleviate pressure on general practice by work people working much more in a networked way and collaborating and utilising the skill sets of different providers. Um, and the, the intent is that the learning and the things that we've been doing here going forward would hopefully sit within the longer term commissioning portfolio for the out of hospital pr provision. So what we wanted to do was not wait for the out of hospital programme to be up and running and ready and all singing all dancing. We wanted to focus on getting some of this stuff moving in the here and now, but the intention is it will then sit within that broader piece of commissioning going forward. So that was our intention. And I'm particularly keen also to, to get it say into the Hinkley area as well. I can I can have a call with the commissioners. I'm not uh, uh, that, 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 that I can do that, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we, we've had a, a really interesting and fruitful discussion today. Uh, I just wanted to capture that really by making a few recommendations. I just wanted to ask if it was possible for this conversation to have been shared with the Cabinet member uh, responsible for health and really for this committee to ask him or her or the Cabinet to just carry on lobbying for uh, the provision of some benefits <coughs> Council Hancock's has highlighted and also to continue to praise the service that's now being delivered and that we really want this to continue into the future. So just at every level to make sure that we as a local authority when we've got a voice at a table, wherever that might be, that we champion this area of work because it's really important to all residents. Second. Yeah. I'm just happy to I'm happy for that to go for all those in favour, please, Jim. I'm just going to say it might be worth bringing this back near the end of the 18 months so we can actually work out how we can help if that's needed to be done. It's a way program for regular. But particularly timely with yeah. sort of. Near the, near the end of their period. I can't make a recommendation because I'm not a member of the group, but could we not lose the conversation that we had about the dying matters and the contribution that you, 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 asked, you, you asked for and suggested? Because I do think that could be really powerful if all the, the workforce could be networked around that. I'm sure we can use it yeah. in touch and put liquid stamps in and our yeah. contact centre. Thank you I think that was really within passing on this conversation to the cabinet member and hopefully they can look at options for ensuring that's delivered. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome to stay, but I'm sure you've got... <laughs> no, no, no. When you mentioned the mobile phones, I realised I've left mine on show in my car, so I've been a little bit twitchy. As long as you've paid your parking, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Move on to eight and seven. Good evening. Yeah. yeah, so my name is Ted Francis, Associate Director of Full Time Family Services in Commission Worship Partnership Trust. And I've come with two colleagues. So I'm Sherrod, I'm the um, service manager for what you all hear more about the RISE service, but what we've been here before and spoken to is the, is the CAM service. And I'm Gemma Cartwright, I manage the uh, Children and Adults Neurodevelopmental Services at the Coventry and Warwickshire. 
and as a general rule, I try not to go anywhere without them. So um, what I thought I'd do is, if we start with the CAMS update, so the new service rise before, and, and Charles going to kind of major on this, but before we get into the detail of it, I just wanted to make kind of a couple of introductory comments. One, that it's obviously a new service that was commissioned um, by Watcher Commissioners, led by uh, Watcher County Council, and it's a fundamentally different approach to providing services, mental health services and emotional <coughs> well-being services in Warwickshire. <coughs> in terms of kind of the scale of the change, the scale is such that um, we're talking about a two-year implementation period because we're talking about significant change. What Michelle's going to do is is take us through that, but also give some updates in relation to where we are with waiting times as well, so you've got your cited on that. It's also probably worthwhile saying as part of the conversation about mental health services, one of kind of the mantras that I always like to say at the beginning of all presentations is that mental health is everybody's business. So part of the conversation is, is about how we make sure that all parts of the system contribute to mental health and well-being of children and young people. Thank you. Yeah. So um, just to kind of add a little bit more detail to um, what Jeff was just saying. So people will be familiar. I think when we were here last month, it's the third time we've been here in the last kind of 18 months. We were in tender process at that at that point, um, and obviously the reason where that came from was way back in 2015 <coughs> with the Future in Mind document, which then fed through to Warwickshire, wanted to really have a national, uh, a local feel based on a national um, paper, which then Warwickshire, you know, really wanted us to have a look at an emotional well-being and mental health service for the all of our children and your people in Warwickshire. So it really is a very new model. So we um, submitted, obviously, I tended through a, a competitive dialogue in partnership, you'll see right up in the corner, you'll always see now the, the traditional NHS with the Coventry and Warwickshire Mind, we are in partnership with Mind, because the model really is emotional wellbeing and specialist mental health service, so it is the full wraparound for children and young people. So we were successful, um, hence why we're here, and our new, new service started on the 1st of August. And as Jess quite right said, it's a seven year contract but with a two year implementation plan built into that. So two years and five years. Because um, it is a real radical change to wrap around services for our children and young people. Warwick County Council are our lead commissioner. Um, and it is very much is um, based on outcomes frameworks <coughs> rather than this is a spec we want. How are you going to deliver? Jenny was just kind of saying it's a very new, new approach to the way commissioning is um, being taken forward and a really positive approach. What was really helpful when we went through the process is that is the council and the CCGs were quite clear saying we haven't commissioned you right from a from an emotional well-being and mental health service. We you know each little bit was commissioned in isolation, which allowed very little kind of cross cover, which then created an awful lot of doors to be navigated through. And and it was very brave, I think, for the commissioners to say, we need to try and do this right. So I you know I do think this has been a really positive change in how we approach and really just like I say, mental health is everybody's business from the top to the bottom. So that's clearly where we are at the minute. Um, we've also changed some of our governance arrangements, which you would expect with any new model. Um, so certainly a much stronger relationship between um, commissioners and ourselves as providers. But also we have key stakeholders, <coughs> and that's really good. And one of the nice things about the competitive dialogue process was it was really well sourced. You know, there was everybody was around the room that had any touch point with a child, young person, or their or their carers. So the the stakeholders was 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 very wide. But you know, the most important thing is is you know while there'll always be a focus on performance, there's also about the quality that goes with that as well. So you'll see that as we go through that model. Everybody needs a model. Um, I mean, that's one of the one of the key things. And people have probably um, been very familiar with the old um, triangle model that we used to have for the demonstrating mental health and children and young people. What we wanted to do is is try and reduce that and change that and look at a kind of very um, collaborative way of working. And when I do refer to we now, it is you know the whole system is country much partnership trust and um, mind together. So the three key areas in our delivery model is um, the navigation hub, community hub, and everybody's using hub, so I appreciate that is the buzzword with everybody at the minute, but um, it, you know, we use it in, the, in the kind of an offer that's, that's, that's being delivered, and the specialist multidisciplinary team. So just to give you some quick headlines, because there's obviously an awful lot of depth in those three key areas. They're actually really, they're integrated with each other, so there isn't just a specialist team, just a community team, just a navigation hub team. What was really um, unique about our model is the blend of all of the areas of specialism in each part of the model. 
So just to give you one example of, of a profession, so a, um, one of our psychologists, <coughs> for example, will contribute within the navigation hub part of the model, but will also be a key player in the community delivery and also be part of the specialist multidisciplinary team. What we think, what we say, and what we think is a really benefit from that is actually they get a feel of the whole wraparound for that child and young person's needs, and that goes very much away from how we used to be commissioned, where you only dealt with the bit that you were being asked to deal with. So you lost the flavour of what else was going on. That's a really important difference in our in our service. So our navigation hub um, is a is a good foundation. Our single point of entry, which we've had in situ for several years. Is, is this what it says on the tin? It's a single point for all entries. That was one of the key areas that people said they really still like. They'd like to know, you know, Warwickshire is a, is a big geography. They'd like to know to just go to one place to get what they want, um, which makes sense, I think, for lots of health <coughs> providers, doesn't it? So we looked at that and we built on the foundations. So some of the key differences will be is it's a much bigger service, the Navigation Hub, it's a much bigger offer. The hours are longer, so you know some of the key deliverables that have already changed is we've extended the you know the accessibility, but also it helps to for anybody who has a touch point with a child who versus care to know it's exactly where to go to and that there's a clinical expertise that's there at that point. Community hope community offer um, the two words kind of um, go together. There's some of the key things that you will see is offering drop-ins, um, group works, interventions, and outreach. What we really want to do is, within the whole model, is work away from a young person having to come into a clinic to have their intervention, but actually that we go to children and young people, and that's both with our most vulnerable young people who have always struggled to come into clinic anyway, but also those who we want to reduce the impact of having to have an intervention delivered to them. So our presence in schools will be a massive change that we'll see over the two-year implementation plan. And then the specialist multidisciplinary team, which still um, it very much holds your, your high level and you know we will always still um, still need children to be in specialist mental health. You know, we're not going to change that overnight. You know, we, our young people will always be faced with significant challenges. So you'll find your psychiatrist there, for example, um, your, your high level consultant psych psychologist. However, they are the overseer of all of the pathways and what you'll see as I just go through is the pathways have already had clinical sign off from our GP commissioners, you know, they're nice guidance. They are showing the quality of the care that we want to deliver, just going back to the previous slide, while there's performance, there also needs to be some quality. Um, it's probably worthwhile saying as well that just building on the point that Michelle made about the community hubs, that there are two community hubs being set up, one in March, one uh, April, which includes North Warwickshire, accepting that North Warwickshire is a wide area. So at the moment we are working hard with county council colleagues to one identify, we've got two potential locations for the hub, so we're trying to pin that down so there will be a community hub that will house drop-ins, support advice, where young people can walk into families, etc. <coughs> and that will be set up soon. So that's one of the things we're working on. Yep, so just some of the, the um, headlines for the implementation plan. As you can imagine, that has it been a two year, there's an awful lot of layers in, in our implementation plan, but some of the high level changes that, you're, that will um, have been taken effect already is the project management and the governance structure, which I've just touched on before, you know, our formal partnership with our colleagues in CW Mind. We always work together anyway, I think that's really important, is we already had a really good solid relationship in how we tried to deliver our children and people's care. What the difference is with this new model is now, we are delivering it together, we are, we are both together producing the outcomes that we want for our children and young people, and that's a really uh, a key driver in our new model. We've had, you know, a second point about workforce, we have had our own workforce challenges. Um, most people know that the shortages of nurses, that's been on, on lots of news reports recently. I even went on and did a radio dialogue for it. You know, we have faced our challenges with, with recruiting in particular nurses and OTs <coughs> um, and some social work colleagues. However, what's been really helpful is the award of the tender. That has made a very big difference. Um, and we have seen um, some real positive recruitment since um, October, November last year. It's probably worthwhile to flag in that, I mean, it's a national problem. So as you can imagine, all localities across the country are trying to expand their, their mental health workforce. We're all fishing in the same pond. And so there's a deficit in terms of psychiatrists particularly, yeah. and nurses, and locally we've had difficulties recruiting psychologists. So it's been quite challenging, and we've procured external capacity from a separate organisation to, to try to plug that gap. The other thing is probably worthwhile just emphasising more, because of the scale of the change, 
also doing development work with the leadership team, the, the MIND and CWPT leadership team to make sure that actually everybody feels supported and have the skills to support staff to make the scale of the change that's required. So it's quite a huge undertaking. Um, Jess just talked a little bit about um, the estates and we have, we've been, we've met, the way that we looked at our community hubs, our community offers, is we've mirrored ourselves with the local authorities, five core areas, so North Warwickshire, so Atherston, Polesworth area, and Eton and Bedworth, Rugby, Stratford and Stratford District, and Leamington, Kenilworth and, and Warwick, because that made absolute sense. And we're already mapped on to early help locality panels, which are those five key areas. So, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a no-brainer, I suppose is the best way to describe it. So what we're doing is, is we're working with not only the local authority, um, as, as, as Jens has quite rightly said, but also the children and young people and families in each of those areas. Because as you will all know from a Warwickshire point of view, just in, in kind of our area of North Warwickshire, the young people in Polesworth need a very different approach to perhaps the young people who live in Bedworth. And what we wanted, although there'll be some core deliverables in each area, we need to deliver what's right and what's what's meaningful to those children and young people in those areas. So that's why two of the areas that we are already working on is, is North Warwickshire, so we've been doing a considerable amount of work with the young people in that area, um, and also in Stratford to understand what they want, but also where they want us to be. One of the key things when we listen to the voice of our children and young people is, they didn't a while, you know, drop-ins are great and having a shop floor, you know, shop uh, front door scenario. What they also didn't want is everything say mental health plastered over the top. What they were really keen is, is actually I'd like to go somewhere where I can perhaps drop in and have some mental health support, but nobody necessarily knows that's directly what I'm going for. Can it be the same place where the library, I'm just thinking of Alliston was one area, it's a particular area. If you're there, and I know you're there on a Wednesday, for example, that's okay for me because I know that that's when you're there, rather than having you know something that's that didn't feel right. And that's that's not <coughs> preventing the, you know the challenges. <coughs> it's just hearing what young people want, and that's and that's really important. Our IT infrastructure and software, which is um, which is huge, as you can well imagine. Um, there are lots of things that are happening, and one of the the key things with the secured extra capacity we got is from an organisation called Helios. Helios deliver specialist uh, mental health, so CAMS um, interventions, but they deliver it over, um, I'm going to use Skype because it's the best way I think people describe it, so it, it's an online um, conversation that happens, but the technology behind it is significantly uh, you know, massive and actually what We've, we so far, they began with us at the beginning of November and they've had 59 young people go through their system on, on our behalf. And what the feedback is from <coughs> the children and people are doing that, actually, they're comfortable with that because it's their, it's their technology in their world. It's not replacing face-to-face, -face. I don't want anybody to think that that's how it's going to be, but it enhances a service that we're trying to very much put as much capacity in as we can. So, And, it, and it's a very new world for all of us, isn't it? It's probably for us for adults. Yeah, it's probably First, it's a generational issue, so the young people feel comfortable with it. Parents and carers feel less comfortable with it, so there is quite a difference in terms of how that's perceived. But also, there's some other things. Um, our website has got a very new uh, feel to it. So the traditional, um, I'm going to say NHS Duck Blue, which most people are familiar with, we wanted to kind of move away from that. So our website now is a Rise website, and that includes all the parts of the model that sit within that. So my colleague Gemma's Neurodevelopmental Service is part of that, and our, our colleagues in mine. It, it has a different feel. And when you go on to the, the new website, you go on it today, it will look different tomorrow because it's building all of the time. And we have a, a real core group of young people that are helping us to develop that because what we wanted it to be is their website that helps children and people, their families and carers, rather than it feeling an NHS information givering. So it is a very different, and it's, and it's got that active feel about it. So I, I would suggest people having a look at that and familiarise and giving us some feedback because that's really important. Link to that is our Dimensions tool, um, which Gemma has been the, the key person in, de in developing, delivering, shaping, creating, I think is the best way to describe it. But one of the things that we really clearly wanted to do with our new model is have a common language because what we clearly recognise in health is we have an awful lot of jargon that doesn't necessarily help understand or put mental health on everybody else's table. So the dimensions tool is a key part of that. It's, it's, it is a common language that we are encouraging everybody to use and Gemma can talk a little bit more about that when we move on to the new red part. Clinical operations, as we, as we said, as quickly said about the specialist provision, there are clinical leads in each, in each part of the pathways. 
So our main pathways, for example, you won't be surprised, are anxiety, depression, attachment difficulties, self-harm, eating disorders. Um, they're our kind of core areas, but we also have other parts of the service that, that we have clinical lead for. Obviously, uh, during our kind of implementation phase, the communications is, is massive and um, we call ourselves a bit of a roadshow sometimes to get out to everybody so that they can see the changes, but also know where to go and to ask questions. So that's a, a key part that's happening. Um, and then obviously there's the contract at the very end. Very important, but for service delivery, it's the detail I think that's more important than here. So just some of the key changes, I've talked about a couple of them already, so from the 1st of August already the navigation hub changed, it went from a Monday to Friday 9 to 5 service to extended hours, some of the things that we were hearing that were really important, schools were, were very clearly saying, <laughs> schools were very clearly that's saying, that's it, that's it, yeah. <laughs> that they, they wanted a, a, their golden hours between the hours of 8 to 9 before the rush of all the children come in, so that's when we start, we start at 8, and our GP colleagues were also saying actually at the end of clinic would be the best time for us to contact you, so we're there later in the evening as well, and that's been really successful. We've talked about the first few um, two hubs that started, we're in the process of having them agreed now, and then the further three will be in the next six months to nine months talked about some of our IT. Um, E-referrals is going to be a really key part in that um, because what I think most people are quite used to that now but it will massively help um, mainstream and, and seamless our service. And crisis care, I think two of the key things um, is crisis care which is part of the new model but also link workers and looking at developing support for our vulnerable children. One of the key areas we wanted in particular was our leaving care uh, population between the age of 16 and 18. Um, because what we recognise is actually they fall through the gaps of everybody, so they don't quite fit adult mental health criteria, they don't want to be seen as a child in children's mental health, so actually where do they go? So we were really clear that that's one of the areas that we wanted to do a big piece of work with, and I'm already working with um, the operational manager, Santosh, and the uh, leading care team. I suppose I'm sort of whip through because I'm conscious I've got this bit, so in terms of performance, just to get you up to speed of where we are, um, there's a number. There, there are a number of key measures um, of CAMS um, responsiveness. So there's the first appointment, which is uh, 18 weeks ref referral to treatment, mm -hmm. for routine um, referrals where the level of difficulty is not too significant. So as a general rule, we have to achieve 95% within 18 weeks. We routinely achieve that target. Recognising that 18 weeks is a long time, quite often when we've looked, when we've actually dug into the data, we probably average about 12 to 13 weeks. So young people with routine needs are not always waiting 18 weeks. Mm -hmm. The other thing is worth saying that in terms of our internal um, decision making, they're higher priority young people that don't fit emergency and urgent criteria that we see between four and six weeks. So in terms of responsiveness for the first appointment, that's our, that, that's kind of a routine. For um, young people that deem to be urgent referrals, we're talking about five days, we always hit that target. Yeah. And for emergency referrals, we're going to come on to this with self-harm, and we'll talk about the self-harm um, piece later on. 48 hours for mental health assessment. Or in relation to the emergency situation, we always hit that target as well. And it's worthwhile saying that within the context of all of these areas, there is increasing demand in the population. So that, that's kind of a feature of all of this. And you'll see that in the self-harm figures. You can yeah. massively see that. One of the big challenges in relation to CAMS is not always the first appointment, because the first appointment actually pretty much we hit the targets. The big area of challenge, which is where normally I, I suspect you'll get feedback on, is about the follow-up appointments. And <coughs> the aspiration that we've got, and we've agreed with commissioners, is trying to have the follow the first follow up appointment within twelve weeks. So we've got we've agreed the trajectory with them to get down to um, twelve weeks, so that for the first follow up appointment, children and people are waiting no longer than twelve weeks. We aim to hit that target. You can see there, twenty uh, third broadly, <coughs> you know, April basically. So that's what we're 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 aiming for. That's the trajectory. And that, as Michelle's already said, the, the key challenges are clinical capacity been difficulties recruiting, which has been one of the challenges, but that's what we're aiming for. Relating to ASD assessments, and again, that's the picture. So over time, you can see there's a degree of, well, there's a number of uh, young people waiting for ASD assessments. Again, part of the picture is, again, when you think about the population, <coughs> autism as a spectrum disorder is actually quite significant in terms of prevalence, and it's challenging in, in relation to one, having the diagnostic capacity, and also just the numbers coming through the door. And I think, again, with autism as it is with mental health uh, difficulties, it is about how 
we work with schools and others to actually manage the difficulties that present with children and young people. But it's challenging, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Just to put this into context, while children and young people are waiting, um, within North Warwickshire for ASD assessments, the national picture, which we might have mentioned before, is that when they've done studying to look at the national picture, we've got young people waiting three and a half years. That's what, that's what research has found out. So whilst they are waiting longer than we would all want here in North Warwickshire, the, it is a real national problem, and like I say, three and a half years is, we're nowhere near that, but like I say, where we, where we are is not where we want to be either. In terms of what we're trying to do to, to improve responsiveness, there's another thing we're trying to do to make sure that children and people get the support and activity, uh, the support that they need as soon as possible. So also really talking about the navigation hub. So a range of things that we've done in relation to making sure we've got the capacity in the navigation hub, we've got the right procedures, and also there's information available and available <coughs> through that source. There's external clinical capacity which we talked about. So we plug our clinical gaps by using Helios as Michelle's spoken about and 59 cases at the minute, but we've got a maximum of 100 cases that we're going to go up to. And it's fair to say that whilst we've procured them on the short-term contract, that is a conversation that we're going to I think we will continue um, thinking about because I don't think the world's going to change in terms of the demand issues. Further recruitment, which Michelle's talked about, we've had six new staff met started in January, there's got six more starting in March. Again, we're continuing to recruit. There's a lot of work we're doing as a trust in terms of thinking about innovative ways of recruiting and training staff because everybody's competing for the same staff in Fisbol to make sure that we understand what's happening with the weights. We have four nightly meetings with Michelle and Gemma come to where we basically are going through an excruciating in detail. Who's waiting, what they're waiting for, what are we doing to make sure they get seen and making sure they get advice. One of the things that's really important to emphasise is young people aren't waiting in a black hole, or families aren't waiting in a black hole for an appointment. There's information and advice, there's a website, and there's also opportunities to phone and have discussions with clinicians about what ad additional support they can get. And also to give us information about how their circumstances changed. But we also share that conversation with commissioners, don't we? Because I think that just really highlights the change in our relationship, because actually they are part of that conversation. So it's very transparent. They're aware of our capacity, they're aware of, our, of the clinical needs that are coming through the front door, and also that there aren't children waiting in the back <coughs> as Jess quite rightly said, that they are being offered support, there is intervention there as they need it. So. And there's early help. So in terms of the outcomes, and I'm I know we only have 50 minutes, we're trying to get through this bit. So the, the general picture in terms of outcomes, when, we're, when we've asked children young people about their experience with the service, it's been wholeheartedly positive. The challenge that, you, that you'll probably hear is people waiting to get access to the service. Once they actually get into the service, the, the general picture has been very positive in terms of them being listened to, them getting the support they feel they need, etc. So it's a generally a very positive picture. And there's some detail there in terms of what um, children young people have said in terms of survey, what we do in terms of experience of service questionnaire. This is from the second quarter. The, the third quarter data has just come out, and unfortunately we couldn't pull it in in time, but we can circulate that as well. But the general picture has been positive in terms of um, young people's experience of services. And that's repeated here. We do session by session outcome ratings where young people are saying, actually, do we feel listened to, etc. And, and the scores that have come back from 154 sessions that we looked at were very, very positive. So the outcomes and the experience has been positive. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour in terms of the new model, the weights, etc. Just and that's kind of one of three presentations, but that's the new model basically. I think it's probably also I, I miss at the beginning just happened to add that the, the word rise has come from the children and young people. So it doesn't people are often asked, but what does it mean? It doesn't actually stand for anything. There's no acronym behind it. It's what they voted, what they reflected on the emotion, because what I very clearly want to say is that actually we don't, CAMS comes with such a history, and we haven't lost the specialist provision, but actually it is a wraparound service for emotional wellbeing and mental health. So the RISE felt the right thing from our children and your people, so they voted for it, and that was their, their choice. I know that's, that's really important, I think, because I just understand where the words come from. <coughs> well, they, so, actually, I think, so actually moved to was a in terms of delivery, just for members noting. So do you the pause now? So yeah. pause again, members got questions yeah. and you can move on to the South Farm one. Um, any member? That's where I have got uh, quite a few questions you might have expected that. Um, but one of the things that, that you said, is it Michelle? Yeah. yeah. Um, is young people in Polesworth have very different needs to young people in Bedworth. Could you just expand on that? Of course I can. 
Some of the things, when we looked at North Warwickshire and the Neaton and Bedworth, things like transport, accessibility in, in able to get to um, places where you would want a youth club, where you would want drop-ins. So not necessarily about their needs, but their needs of the environment that they're in. Sorry, that's probably not me making, making sense. Um, and, and lots of the questions that we did with young people, because we, we worked with all of the, the five key areas. And where do you find it easy? What do you find about living in the area that you live in? And they were some of the, the key differences that we, that we find. So does that make more sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, um, you talked about two hubs by the end of March. And you mentioned North Warwickshire. And then you mentioned lots of places in Warwickshire, but not Coventry, but is, is Coventry outside of this? Yes. Because it's yeah. A Cov yeah, because it's a Warwickshire contract, <coughs> okay. the, the five hubs relate to um, Warwickshire. So it's Stratford and North Warwickshire for the first two hubs. And then uh, Michelle was referring to the three other areas that would have hubs. <laughs> in so, Warwickshire. So, so there, there will be a hub in Nuneaton and Bedworth? Yes. But mm. not by March? The first two, when we when we looked at, agreed the implementation plan with the commissioners, we looked at the five key areas, and the first two areas that were felt priority was North Warwickshire and so North Warwickshire referred to as Polesworth, Atherston, Mansetto area, and Stratford. So those two are the ones that we've done the estates conversations with. That we, you know we've had the work with the local area. The other three are already in conversation, so they've kind of been happening in a tandem, if that makes sense. But the first two that will be live at the end of March will be North Warwickshire and. Stratford District and then the next three will come on board over the next six to nine months and that was all part of the implementation plan that we agreed with commissioners. Okay, and, um, I'm all right yeah. you, you went through a list of difficulties, uh, depression, um, anxiety etc and you mentioned attachment difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, could you just explain what that is please? Of course I can. So attachment difficulties and you hear it um, referred to in lots of different forums and lots of different different areas. For us from a, a specialist emotional wellbeing service we, we look at anything that causes an anxiety in a child could potentially be based on some attachment difficulties so one of the clearest uh, uh, ways to look at it is in particular with our young people with an ASD diagnosis quite often the presentation could be either or, or both and what we really want to do and, and I'm part of the parent and infant mental health strategy as well is I think there's, there's an element of um, dirty word attached to attachment difficulties but actually everyone in this single room will have an element of an attachment difficulty. It has become quite a difficult subject and difficult topic for us to have. For us, uh, you know, our overall aim is to support <coughs> a young person and their carers and, and um, whether that's guardians, whether it's a particularly looked after children, to feel as if they have a healthy attachment in the world that they live in. That's our aim. What we never do is <coughs> attachment disorder because we don't feel it's a disorder. It's a, you know, it's a difficulty that can occur for lots of different reasons. So, so if you think about kind of the, the, the physical health world and health visitors, midwives, etc. So one of the objectives in, in very headline terms is trying to make sure that in effect a child has a secure relationship with at least one of their parent carers and the lack of a secure relationship feeling safe with one at least one of your parent carers leads to the difficulties that Michelle's talking about so it's it, in terms of kind of the, the kind of the origins of it we're talking about the word that midwives health officers essentially do right from the outset in terms of that first thousand one critical days of the child antenatally to the first two years of life of that child mm -hmm. and making sure that in effect that child feels that they've got a secure relationship with at least one of the parents or carers and and the lack of that security causes then other emotional difficulties mm -hmm. and one of the key things that a midwife will now ask and um, just for example because it does start right at the beginning is not how you know when you when you think of a mother having uh, through their pregnancy or how are you feeling? You know, blood pressure's okay, your legs are <coughs> early, but actually what they're now starting to say is, how are you feeling about your baby that's inside you? Yeah. So we're trying to work right at the very beginning to make attachment a healthy word rather than it being seen as an unhealthy word. Um, and that's that really is starting right, right, right at the beginning before baby's born. So. And this goes back to myself being everybody's business because to get to do that attachment work, we are talking about midwives, health officers, as well as others playing a quite a significant role in it, in that piece of work. Um, can I give you some feedback on that? Because, uh, as you say, uh, nearly every 
young person is getting a diagnosis of attachment difficulties, which may be alongside um, autism. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they get offered some courses to help them, to help the parents learn how to um, overcome the attachment difficulties for their young people. Um, and you talked about your changing hours, um, but the courses are during the daytime. And um, I was just reading a thread um, yesterday or the day before where um, th this is a, a letter here from CAMS offering uh, this family to go on a series of courses uh, between 10 and 12 or 12.30 till 3. Mm -hmm. um, Almost all of the parents are in work. They talk about working um, in zero hour contracts, so they can't take time off. And so, so they're not able to access any help mm -hmm. that, that is being offered. So I wanted to feed that back mm -hmm. to you. And, and, and I think that's really helpful because, to be honest, one, one of the things that Michelle was talking about in terms of the service and Gemma will say similarly is we're trying to make sure that our service is accessible. So the times at which um, training development sessions are on, are on offer and where they're on offer are critical so the points that you're making are absolutely things that we need to think about it's probably also worthwhile saying that in terms of the attachment piece and and there is obviously the specialist mental health part of it as well as the new development <coughs> part of it, it's also worthwhile saying that there's a lot of stuff that that happens early early on with the work that health visitors particularly are doing and <coughs> the nurse partnership in terms of trying to make sure that parents are um, much more attuned to what they need to do, how they need to work, how they need to think about um, the relationship with the child, etc. So I think there's a lot of layers to this in terms of responding and working on attachment. We've got one very clear one where there's where it becomes quite a difficulty, a significant difficulty. But early on, it, it's it's the core work of the likes of health visitors, family nurse practitioners, etc. So it, it is quite there's there's a lot of other players involved in this. Online support is available as well, so I know there's on the online solid hole approach that I know is used in Warwickshire. There's stuff that, that others do as well, So, but the point you're making in terms of accessibility of sessions is an absolutely fair point and we need to look at that. And um, I, think, I think it's the last <coughs> question. Um, is there anything on the horizon for training to be given to school staff because a lot of the um, people that come through CAMS are coming through CAMS because they're, they're just coming up against um, really outdated attitudes in the schools or the children are being excluded from schools. So they're turning to CAMS, whereas if there was more awareness and um, kind of empathy and just just some training in schools. Absolutely. You wouldn't be firefighting. And definitely, uh, and I think you've hit really what, what some of the reasons, you know, in particular why we do have weights in, in the special provision is because they're over subscribed, I suppose is the best way to put it, because people don't know where else to go and there isn't that infrastructure that's sitting underneath. What's really going to, you know, one of the new things with our new model is, is to almost flip that coin. So although it's still recognising children and people will need to go directly into specialist mental health, there are a lot of children and people that we want to prevent coming into specialists, but still have that blend of specialism throughout the whole system. So definitely, our primary mental health teams, the way it was commissioned before, was one person for the whole of Warwickshire, and it was a 12-month fixed term all the time from our local authorities. So actually, that was one of the really brave things, that's actually, that's part of the, of the failings. So our primary mental te health team is part of that, the 12 staff that we've had coming through. So we've gone from one to a team of five. So that will enable that <coughs> to feel an awful lot stronger. But also by us coming together with our colleagues in mind, they already as well deliver um, prevention and resilience projects within schools. So the big umbrella is one in particular, where it is that whole school approach to actually working with our children and people, building their emotional resilience and preventing what we want to, you know, what we want to do, all of us, is, is a mental health condition. Because as we know, when young people present with mental health at 14, it often ends up staying with them into their early adult years. So that is going to be a, a significant change. We already have delivered um, since the school started in September. So we've been growing what now second term, haven't we? We've already delivered. I think it's I think it's roughly about 464 workshops to teaching staff in Warwickshire. 
So actually it is something that's already starting to roll out and that's making a significant difference. The three key areas that schools ask us to help them with is, is anxiety and depression, so we lump that together as mood difficulties, self-harm and an attachment because they're also hearing that word an awful lot in schools. So that's going to build more and more and that will be one of the significant differences with the community hub, community offer is those link workers will get in the schools and also start to recognise what each different type of school needs. But I think it's worthwhile saying that we will do all of that, we'll continue to do all of that. Schools are absolutely the big game in town. Absolutely. When we think about the number of schools, the number of school children and the prevalence of emotional well-being difficulties, mental health difficulties, we haven't got the scale, to be blunt, we haven't got the scale to cover the ground that's needed. And that's recognised nationally, which is where the Green Paper comes in. So there's a recent Green Paper that's come in looking at the mental health, <coughs> health, and mental health of, of young people, which is proposing, in very headline terms, setting up mental health um, teams in schools, co-led by NHS services and also schools, having mental health specialists, designated specialists within the schools that link, that, that provide support and advice within the school and link to the, the specialist services. And also, I mean, those are the two core bits. The, the, the critical thing is the government's recognising that through the Departments of Health and Department of Education for Education, that actually schools are the big game in town. They need to find significant resources to deliver mental health support upskilling staff etc at scale so it's a huge program that they're talking about doing through this green paper what we're what we're having to discussions about with the commissioners is the potential for us to be a pilot mm -hmm. um, and pilot good th this working what Michelle's referred to is was I think good practice in terms of our approach but there's an issue of scale that I think is the challenge the other thing just to add as well for children with autism um, Warwickshire have just begun uh, specialist teachers who were previous part of IDS and have a separate <laughs> trading service and they're rolling out um, AT training and autism education training which has happened in Coventry quite a long time ago um, so now it's actually getting into Warwickshire so that would be helpful for those because that potentially those children being excluded may very well be the children with autism. <coughs> I think it's Margaret indicated first. I think actually, really, Councillor Elliott asked, my, my question was really in, in, in how you saw schools uh, supporting, uh, you know, the supporting role that they have <coughs> and, you know, how you were going to go about achieving uh, this support from the schools. But I think you've more or less answered uh, the, the question. I, I, I just, I, perhaps, with, um, what sort of criteria would you be looking for to judge, you know, whether this this sort of work with the schools was was being achieved? Um, I, I think I mean the, there's a there's a number of bits. I know I'm not the expert, so I'm jumping in first. But there, there's a number of things. I mean, first of all, I think there's a recognition that emotional health, and well-being, emotional health, and well-being, and also mental health is so significant in terms of the impact on school children that something needs to be done which is where the, why the green papers um, emerged and it's talking about all schools having designated specialists having teams etc I think before that arrives there was something about the if I'm going to be honest the leadership within schools because the, the ability for us to engage and succeed in that engagement with schools is partly dependent on the attitude of the leadership of the schools so if a, a head teacher for example or a senior team in schools believe mental is important we need to think about how we upskill staff, how we make sure school kids feel supported, etc. Mm -hmm. Then we're kind of knocking on an open door. If there's less of a view of that, and there's more of a view on actually it's all about achievement, and actually we're interested in that and nothing else almost, being crude, then actually we're not knocking on an open door and we've got an uphill battle. So there is something, to, there's something about the environment of schools, the schools' responsiveness and receptiveness to the mental health agenda, not seeing it as stigma, but seeing it as an essential part of, you know, the roundness of a child. So, so I think that is one of the challenges. The, the new contract has schools as an equal partner of the system, so we need to make sure that schools are playing their part by making sure that school teachers and staff are upskilled mm -hmm. and are confident in relation to mental health issues. And it's working with the schools and working out who are those right key people, rather than schools just sending some staff because they have to, they, they haven't that they don't have anything else to do, but it's, you know they're free at that time. It's about working with schools. Say actually, 
what's the maximum effect based on what, because obviously schools have their own challenges and it is recognising that. What we always clearly said with the new model is, let us be the leaders because it is our specialism, but you have got to come with us to make the ultimate change. So that's, that's one of the biggest differences. Um, and schools did play a big part on the competitive dialogue from a stakeholder point of view, so they knew that was the message that we were given right at the beginning. So. I think the Green Paper's aim is 2025, so there's, it kind of, the, for us, the Green Paper was really positive because it was giving us more on what the journey we felt we were already at for Warwickshire and Coventry in particular. So certainly that's why we think we're in a really good position to be a pilot because it almost feels as if we've done a lot of the work already. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I've been very British. I don't want to jump the queue. <laughs> uh, the key <coughs> issues that we're actually discussing uh, and although I understand because you've got to chair the meeting, they are separate agenda items. They're actually interlinked because they're all about a journey uh, and they are all connected. Uh, and I want to offer a little bit of challenge here <coughs> in the sense, I can see that you're proud of the work you do and proud of your staff and rightly so, and the team that we've got before us, you should all be proud. Equally. We, and it may be a national problem, but we, there are concerns about the services that are provided and the stories parents come to us yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, because they're not just case studies, they're people, as, as you will agree. Absolutely. And so I, in offering a bit of challenge, it would be useful, whether it's in this meeting or in future, just keep local councillors updated about how can we, as policy makers, lobby the county council, lobby the CCG, lobby others, or champion your services. <coughs> and also give a voice <coughs> to the people who are having these difficulties so we can meet them. Uh, uh, they're, they're safeguarding issues, but I mean opportunities for young people to have a voice. And we aren't just representatives of adults in the community, we're representatives of everyone. Uh, and that obviously includes parents. I would chair, like to ask, and I'm not going to ask all of you, but I would like hopefully a written response if, pos if we can get hold of one from the commissioners in response to why others were put priority ahead of Nuneaton and Bedworth when we've got the most people and the most need. Uh, and so I'm surprised that others were picked to have hubs before us. And I just wonder whether we can expedite plans to try and have a hub here. Well, we've got it's Hatter's face, okay. so we've already right. got it. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. So when I say things have been happening tandem, some of the conversations is actually what's what's been freed up so we can get in quicker. So Hatter's space, there's the um, there's the area next to it, um, which is empty. Actually, that the local authority have said you can have it rent free. You just need to pay your on you know your, your gas and your electricity. So some of those conversations is what's been part of the of the of the choice of where we go first. So it's not necessarily about the needs of children and young people, um, but they, yeah, those conversations. So we've been having an awful lot at the same time. So the, the final the final point I want to make, and, and it was actually mentioned at the start, is that mental health matters to all of us. Okay. And. I'm a grown up now, I've actually experienced CAM services and they're vital really mm -hmm. to improve people's life chances when they're young children. Yeah. Uh, I was born at 29 weeks, I was premature, I had lots <coughs> of physical issues, I was deaf, I've had lots of operations. Uh, but I've also suffered throughout my entire life, I've battled with depression and anxiety. Uh, and I've self-harmed and I've ended up in hospital because I've attempted suicide on multiple occasions. And young people really need that support. I was really lucky that I had a, have an amazing mom and nana and sister and people who care and who were there and able to support me. But I also had my doctors and GPs who went into the schools to meet people. And I think parents don't have that now. A GP who can just go into the school or a pr practitioner from the hospital who can accompany them to a meeting. You are their last port of call really, but you're their only port of call. And so it's really important that we support parents in, in reaching out, really. Uh, and so I know how vital these services are, and anything we can do, uh, I'm happy to support you, and I'm sure others are. In respect of suicide or self-harm, we'll speak about that in a minute, but these services are vital, and 
if there is any opportunity for us to hear the stories of young people or parents, and not just the good ones, yeah. where things are going wrong, yeah. mm -hmm. and we can make a difference. Yeah. And, and, and thank, thank you for, for, for the points you've made. I mean, I would honestly say to, to all of you, that one of, one of the things that I think all of us find really, really difficult is the knowledge that we can't see young people as quickly as we want to see them, and that we haven't got the capacity to see as many young people as we would all want to. So I think that is a burden of good, be candid with you, it's a burden that weighs heavily on us. Because, I mean, if you, if you come to our teams, I mean, our teams, you know, people trained to care for people, to support people. And, and one of the most challenging things with the demand is because in society, mental health and emotional wellbeing issues are, are on the increase. And, and our, our inability to cover the ground that we <coughs> want to cover is quite challenging. <coughs> so I absolutely accept your point, and I do know that there are um, experiences from families that aren't what we want them to be and we're open to that and, and people are waiting longer than we want them to wait in, in instances and I think we want to be we want to be transparent and open and have those honest conversations because ultimately what we want to do is make things better we think this new model is a huge opportunity to make things better and the point you're making about um, the contribution of parents GPs and others it's, it's part of this because, like I say, this is not, the specialist service can never cover the ground uh, that needs covering. So it is about how we may get all parts of the system, schools, GPs, etc., to play their part. So, absolutely fair, fair point and absolutely fair challenge. And I know we've had a challenge before, and, and uh, I suppose what I'm saying is we, are, we accept the challenge in terms of not being able to cover all the ground, but we equally are committed to do what we can. And we're happy to come back periodically to give you updates as well. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, pick up on the point that um, Jess made earlier, actually, about school leadership teams. Um, I'm actually on a school leadership team, so hopefully I can provide a little bit of context and sort of like what it's like yeah. from uh, from the other side. And uh, the point that you made about sort of like the door being open and some leadership teams very much being <coughs> open to discussing mental health and trying to address it, and others being much more focused on achievement. Um, I think the point that you're perhaps missing is that schools more and more now are realising that there is a direct correlation between the two. Um, and in a lot of the work that I do, I mean, I work mainly with um, sixth form students and sort of monitoring their progress. And from all of the research that I've done um, in terms of scrutinising the data, is that those students that are making the least progress, there's a massive correlation um, be between those that are suffering with about anxiety, depression, all of those other issues that you... Um, you've raised. And I think Councillor Elliot made a really good point earlier about working with schools. We've had m many conversations around our leadership table where we've identified that the issue is with mental health, but we don't know how to address it. We're not mental health professionals and we know what the problem is. And it's very frustrating when all we can really do is signpost. We, we, we can't address the issues head on. All we can do is signpost them in your direction which is then creating the issues at your end with the waiting times um, and that side of it. And I think probably the, the one single thing that you could do that would probably have the largest impact in trying to reduce that is working more closely with schools and how we can be more proactive in preventing them from getting to you. So the things that we do work in at an earlier age, I mean, you've used the word resilience a lot, and that has become a buzzword in schools massively. Yes. Talk about building resilience. Uh, right from an early age, you know, not crumbling at the smallest sign, signs of pressure. But most of it, you know, we're just trained in subject areas. We know how to like deliver a good geography lesson or a good history lesson. But actually, we really struggle with that side of it and how to and to that, work with the students. And that's absolutely. I mean, we've we've heard that message. And some of the key things of us now being a system around the child is being there at the point when you need us, rather than kind of towards the end of year mm -hmm. ten, year eleven, year, and, and year, you know when you're into sixth form. It's almost as if that resilience work is too late, yes, isn't it? Yeah, so it absolutely. is about being right at the beginning. So we're already working with our colleagues from Compass Our School Nurses, and public health have provided us a post to support the bit between the two, because there's, there's still a gap, but actually it's looking at the, the transition point, so that the questionnaires that are done at reception and at year six and at year nine, isn't it? Actually, what is happening there? How can we do something now to prevent year nine becoming the year 10 difficulties that are then needing the referrals into specialist camp. So there's all those layers. I mean, it would be great if we could click our fingers and it'll all be better tomorrow, wouldn't it? But, it is but there are the changes that are happening. 
one of the things that with the you know when we look talk about the five hubs is there'll be link workers for those schools in those areas and we're just doing the work with actually trying to work out how schools cluster themselves but you know one touch point maximizes the most so that actually when schools are starting to recognise the difficulty, they know to go to somebody before it needs to get to the point of a CAMS referral. So all those are the biggest things that you'll start to see a massive difference. And, and you know, the, there'll always be schools that are open arms and some schools that say, actually, I'm not quite sure how to open my arms. I think it's probably the best way to describe it. But it's for us to kind of help lead on that and then for schools to continue with the work. And that and absolutely, and I know, and you've you've provided a challenge. So I want to provide a little bit of challenge back. On that. <laughs> just a little bit of challenge back. So absolutely agree with what you're saying. You're part of a leadership team, so you know what I'm not just being that whatsoever. But I suppose my question is that are you confident that all leadership teams have got that same attitude and approach? And for example, if you've got children, young people in schools who, for whatever reason, unknown to us, their behaviour means that they're disruptive in classrooms, etc., and there's no obvious answer. How do those children get supported? What's the responsibility of the school to be upskilled and understand how to have strategies to manage those situations for, you know, versus just passing it on to a specialist service? So all I'm saying is that it, it takes, it's not, it's not a straightforward answer to the question. And I, I absolutely accept that there's a lot of good leadership teams in schools that understand the correlation between mental health difficulties and achievement. But equally what I'd say is some of the some of the things that are happening in schools are mental health and sometimes they're sent to camp. So that, that's one of the challenges as well. And I think there's something about what responsibility and skills can we build in schools and capability and capacity can we build in schools so that there's more self-management within that school environment and we're providing that support. And all I'd say is I think we're still on a journey in relation to kind of getting that work. <coughs> that that'd be my Minor challenge break. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not going to be an overnight fix. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Alice, you wanted to come um, Yeah, you, you mentioned the green paper, which um, I've got some of that in front of me. Yeah. Uh, is that the one where the consultation closes midnight on March the 2nd? Yes. Which, which we didn't know about, um, so it might be interesting for, for everybody to kind of be told about that. Um, the, the green paper looks at transforming young people's mental health and you talk about children being more resilient and um, we do a lot of work at college I'm in in uh, trying to make young people more resilient so they, they overcome their anxiety and depression but it, it fails to address the issue that there are now 14 million people living in poverty the long-term harms that results from living in chronic poverty and um, lead into life, lifelong mental health difficulties. Um, just the Green Paper totally overlooks that and I just wanted to comment and make that point that you can be as resilient as, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can be trained how to be, but um, until those underlying uh, lack of social mobility, etc., is addressed, um, the schools turning into exam factories. Until that's changed, um, your workload is just going to rise rise and rise, and it's not going to make any difference. And and absolutely, the point you make, the correlation between deprivation of poverty and mental health difficulties is proven. So we know that if, if there is significant deprivation area, there will be health difficulties generally, but mental health difficulties, so you're absolutely right. That is part of the context. And I think the debate around the Green Paper, I mean, there was one of the na a national body for psychotherapists may kind of wrote an article uh, probably a couple of weeks ago saying they welcomed the principles, but s touching on some of the points that you're making, which is actually how is this going to be resourced? Because this, cause it's an absolutely right thing, the scale of the change has been <coughs> spoken about, but how is it going to be resourced? Thinking about the school's capacity and what challenges they've got, thinking about mental health workforce, and how that's going to be built, etc. So the principles are great, but there's something about how how practically to make it happen. And that's why I think there's an opportunity to be a pilot. So the Warwickshire Commissioners have been part of a conversation about is there an appetite to put in um, a bid to be a pilot so we can almost like be first in, in, in the kind of the race to say actually how can we make this work. So I think there's an opportunity to think about how we might be a pilot potentially. <laughs> Um, a lot of this service is like a fire brigade for the mind. 
Um, and what the fire brigade do a lot of the time isn't just put fires out, but actually look why was there a fire. Absolutely. Um, and one of the big sort of generators of work is actually people's experience <coughs> at school. And I wondered whether, out of all the stuff you're doing, whether you're actually keeping enough statistics and sort of general knowledge amongst your staff to actually give like a red, green, amber for the, 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 the sort of mental um, safety or well-being of, of individual schools. So you can actually say, well, actually school Y or school A is producing a very little workload. And not just that it's produced, but obviously that can be for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, because the, it's actually not detecting problems. Mm -hmm. Or B, it could actually be a, a healthier environment. <coughs> but I think there is, in any <laughs> type of this, a great value in actually working out places where there might be a particular bullying problem or a particular um, pressure to do well problem. Yeah. Um, so actually, in future years, actually something can be done about the culture in a school, yeah. about things that are causing problems. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's very hard probably for you to actually go and judge schools, yeah. but. It, on another way, <laughs> um, on another way though, it is actually like the fire. Yeah, yeah. You, it is useful to actually see if there are any particular areas that are very stressful or very un unhelpful. And certainly, the key areas that they ask, so the reception, the year six, and the year nine, do start to ask that question. So they group it, and you probably know more about this one being in the visual. Actually, is there an emotional well-being difficulty with this school? Is there a behavioural? So there is some start from a public health point of view, but. I would say, uh, being really kind of kind of hard nosed about it, if schools would judge Ofsted framework judges schools in recruiters, if Ofsted embraced mm. this agenda, <laughs> then that might be a vehicle for change. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that sounds a very good idea to actually mm. suggest that Ofsted look a bit more about mental welfare because. What we want to do is put you out of a job and actually help <laughs> <laughs> but have healthy schools yeah. just yeah, like yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because you're right, for not referring in, there's a gap there. And we do know that that's yeah. If I might just add, Chair, schools are part of society. Absolutely. And we just referred to the comment about people living in in poverty. And you know, one of the things that you would be looking at would be <coughs> what sort of catchment areas you've yeah, got. As I say, schools schools are part of society, not a not somewhere, you know, sort of that floating out there. Uh, and one one of the things just thinks in. I mean, I was at a meeting in Coventry today. A talk, they've got a partnership all for children and young people services. So this so one of the things that was an item on that agenda was child poverty, and the scale of it and the impact it is having on a range of outcomes for children and young people so you're absolutely right in terms of not separating out what's happening in school within the context of what's actually happening in society in particularly deprivation of poverty and the knock-on effects of it so that that was a big conversation in in the board this 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 morning in Coventry. I've got a couple of points myself now I'm conscious of time now um, in terms of the hours you've said that you've extended your hours you haven't mm -hmm. actually said what you've extended mm -hmm. hours are so the navigation hub is eight or six so that's when you've got accessibility information, <coughs> Monday to Friday, 8 to 6. We also are doing in certain areas Saturday assessment clinics. So um, one thing that, that um, we have for young people in care is actually they, they struggle to commit to a Saturday from their own work, but actually for an assessment, that's that's really helpful. So we're already doing that in certain areas. And that hits, that's changes with regard to the, the time of the year and, and um, whatever the response rate is. But also, we're also piloting some evening, which is really helpful for your comments, some later evening. But also, within hours, it's what we can deliver that's more flexible. So we're in conversations with, um, in Lenington with seeing if we can use one of the childcare centres. So there's a, a crash facility for parents who've got younger children who also need to attend. So we're trying to be as creative as we can, but also trying to be as, as creative outside as well. So. And you've mentioned about the coping and then you've mentioned, I presume you were told about the children's centre. Yeah. Yeah. It's so quite ironic because yeah. in the county shut the children's centre, but one moved children's services in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually in my pad, so I'm pleased about that. However, I do wonder how people from the outline areas are going to get there. Yeah. And so that's going to be some of our challenges in the, in the services. So I think that needs, you know, we've said a lot in this committee about transport, 
accessible services. So I think that's something you really need to know where um, We do have a buzz. Um, and I noticed the Journeys buzz was in Nuneaton yesterday, so that's part of our partnership with mine. So <coughs> our plan is to take the buzz to the areas that are going to be really hard to reach areas. So we, we, we do, it's not the biggest, it's not the answer for all of that, but it's as, as much as we can give, we you know, in the kind of capacity that we have. Um, so yeah, I did notice that was in the town centre yesterday. So if we move on to the South Island. So the ground could have is some information about self harm prevalence, but also the acute liaison team, which is our team that works with young people that have acute admissions. So just some quick statistics. I mean, these won't be unfamiliar to people, I'm sure. I think we presented these because there's been nothing new since 2014 um, from um, <coughs> core services. So just quick context of, of the percentages <coughs> of breakdown of why children um, <coughs> self-harm, and I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody, really. Um, we, we know that self-harm is more prevalent in girls who would approach services. Um, for the boys, it doesn't mean that it isn't happening with boys as well. Um, and it was the highest increase in self harm has been in particular young girls between the ages of 13 and 16. We do know there's still um, drugs and alcohol involved, and just picking up on our previous conversation, the high rates in more deprived areas. Um, and obviously, 12 months um, post self harm is often reported that one in five will self harm again. So, I think everybody's probably really agreeable that it's a real significant challenge for, for all of us. That just that's the, the national picture that we presented. I said there hasn't been any new national figures since 2014, but you can see that the change is huge in, in the increase of young people presenting with um, self harm to acute trust of our paediatric boards. Um, and it just mirrors what we were saying about um, one in every 12 to 15 young people. Um, and I remember when I was here last time, we talked about the change in, in the way that children and young people are um, self harming. Um, and I did mention, you know, uh, probably about 15 years ago, paracetamols became less of an issue because we'd got the reduced packets from being able to buy as many as you could to, to the packets of 16. However, what we have started to see again is the use of overdosing has increased with our children and young people, um, and that, that's quite a significant factor, as you, as you can see. Um, and that's obviously nationally, but also locally, that's, that's our, our strongest factor. Um, I think this is a real shocking fact um, that um, self-harm is the second most common cause of death among 10 to 24 year olds, other than road traffic accidents. And half adolescents who die by suicide do have a history of self-harm. So I think nobody would, I think, would say actually this isn't something that we're all very serious about. These are our national figures for Coventry and Warwickshire. The local figures should say, so you can see they are very similar to the national figures. <coughs> actually, um, forty-six percent <coughs> of children and people that we've seen between a year from October two thousand and sixteen to September were as a result of, of ingesting um, other substances, so overdosing. Um, and we have seen less in terms of lacerations, which is something that was more of what we saw five years ago. So the behaviour patterns have, have changed. But it just is some of the other difficulties <coughs> that we see from children and people who present at the acute trust get seen by acute liaison team. Uh, we did some comparative data for you so you could see the difference um, since 2016 and 2017. Obviously the figures in red are the ones that are showing the significant increases. Um, it's also interesting when you see a full year, how you can see the difference from month from month. So we do know, um, even in our core services, that we see an increase in referrals at particular times of the year, exam times, um, Christmas times, post-Christmas, and, and you can see there's a very you know, clear mirror of those as well in our, in our uh, prevalence of self-harm and the people presenting at acute trust. But, um, um, from, you can see from the maths, our total in 2016 was 597 and we've got 747 for our total of 2017. So that's a significant increase, 150, which um, is cross coverage in Russia, so it's definitely something more. This is interesting, um, it's, I think whenever you compare some, de some data, so this is particularly just for Nuneaton and Bedworth. Um, uh, the blue line obviously is for 2015 when you see less of a, um, an amount, it's still a significant problem, but obviously less in numbers, 2016 and 2017. What we've been able to see is there's some clear spikes, and we looked, as you can see, the September 2017 is 
too high from what you see you expect an up and down because in relation to different times of the year for our children and young people but actually there was a significant increase um, last year obviously in 2017 so we looked at those and we looked at the numbers and the year because obviously we have the date of birth for our young people the highest proportion were the 2002 year group which were those young people going into their GCSE years and I think that's that's quite significant although we always see an increase when it, when children and people go into that period of their exam period November when it's mock exams actually whether that's because obviously the, the way the GCSEs changed was significant last year and it went from grades to numbers in particular for maths and English which was an awful lot of pressure on our children and young people I don't know whether it's anything there it's only when you look at the data which you collected obviously this is something we collected at the end of 2017 so it's still quite new data for us but there is something there that we need to have some some investigation and some conversations about because um, it seems too much of, a, of an increase to be a, to be a one-off. Um, so um, I know when we were here last time, um, uh, Claire Mulligan came, who's a team leader from the Acute Liaison Team. So the Acute Liaison Team, for those who may not have been there, have been with us. Um, we developed that service back in 2015 when we recognised there was an increase in children and young people presenting on our acute ward. So for, for obviously here, um, it's not George Elliott because they don't have a, an open heart pediatric facility, so it's UHCW, um, but also South Warwickshire, because we do find that there's a crossover in two areas. They constantly still see children and people within 48 hours. That was the figures that we gave right at the very beginning, because what we recognise is acute trust, our pediatric wards are not the right place for our children and young people to be. However, we are seeing an increase in numbers and we are seeing a change in the complexness of their presentation. Um, certainly um, more children and young people are presenting on wards with social care involvement and social care difficulties. So whether that's um, a full care order or whether it's down to a cap, the spectrum of the, of the involvement, we're seeing that far, far more increased. Also some of the difficulties we're also seeing is young people who have an ASD or are waiting for an ASD diagnosis who are presenting with difficulties of, of saying they want to kill themselves, but actually there isn't anywhere else for those children and people to go at the moment, so they do present on the paediatric wards. What's really good is, is that this is being heard, not that obviously it's happening, but it is being heard, and our colleagues in NHS England and our commissioners are, we're currently sitting around the tables at the moment and having active conversations about not only crisis care, but also a home treatment model. And I think it's really important to see the difference because once a young person has taken the overdose and presented on the ward, their crisis has gone because it's, you know, the, the act of the self-harm has been what's managed their crisis internally. What's really important <coughs> is to look at what we can do to prevent that crisis in children and young people. So a home treatment model that's what we need to spend a lot of time thinking. So we need the two, I'm not saying that we don't, but we need to look at how we enable young people to feel that there's another alternative to being on a paediatric ward as a result of a crisis. And there is a clear, massive drive for us to have something very quick to enable that to make a difference. I mean, there's lots of factors, and it's interesting that we've got to this point in the conversation, I don't think anyone's mentioned about social media, but when you think of the impact of social media, it is absolutely huge in children and young people. Not that it's a, 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 you know, not always a, a positive, because there are some really good positives about it, but actually just in the context of bullying, for example, it means it happens 24 hours a day, and even if that child and young person isn't directly being bullied, they will be aware of their social circle that's being bullied, so it's almost, there's no rest from that and what's quite interesting we've met with some of our um, MPs recently and, and looked at how we support parents to view social media differently because actually I think children and people get it better than we do but uh, you know the simple thing is you know the rules of the house if you put your social media on the TV cabinet before you all go to bed if you're if you're asking your child to do that and then we as adults are taking hours off to bed then actually what what are we trying to do so there's some programs and some conversations being had around around that, but what we are, we are seeing is it's, it's, we seem to be at a very high peak with our children and young people presenting with self harm and suicidal ideation. Sorry, and I've whizzed through that very quickly because I'm aware we've taken a lot of time. All, all the things I would have raised on the previous one were covered anyway, so otherwise I would have typed up, don't worry. Do <laughs> <laughs> so you wish to speak on this item? Well, just, I mean, it's sort of almost been brought up, I think, because, I mean, things that are happening now 
going back to when I was at school and things. I mean, it's just so much more mm. visible and what have you. And it's almost just hearing some of these stories on the telly and what have you. Does that actually feed it and put ideas into people's heads and social media feeding it? Yeah, I think absolutely. And it's it's from every <coughs> single every single direction. And um, there are lots of things that are on the internet that are. You know, particularly fr very frightening things like people might have heard of the blue whale. That's a particular program. There's also something called blackout, which is very frightening. Thing that hooks children, young people in, and actually then, you know, it's very difficult to try and work out what's going on um, because they they're in their room, they're in their their confined space, and actually you have no idea. And there is a massive role in education, but also, and it's it's quite interesting if you look at the green paper. There's a um, Jeremy Hunt, our secretary of state, did a, a I think it's a webinar. <coughs> probably right terminology <coughs> but one of the key things was about what's the roles and responsibilities of our social media generators as well because they do play a part in that it's not the main reason for it but it is a massive contributing factor it, it, it certainly is um, and we are you know part of the the bigger picture to, to make sure that that message is, is, is being put across one of the mm. things as well um, not all of the children who are self-harming have been known to services yeah. before so the responsibility from us is we, we can do what we can do if they're known to us, but there's a high percentage that have never been known to mental health services. It's almost half. Yeah. And it's worth while saying that when the, the, the national study, there was one of the earlier slides that talked about the 68% increase in um, self-harm rates for uh, 11 to 13, no, 13 to 15 year old girls, one of that same study was highlighting the fact that not all self-harm is directly related to mental health. Mm -hmm. So there's also a conversation um, in society about actually this is not a direct um, correlation with your self-harm, therefore there's a mental health issue. So, and that might sound strange, but that's also part of the awareness and understanding that needs to be raised in society in terms of who then is best placed to respond to that issue and how to respond to the issue as well. It's one of the most common things that were asked by schools to help them develop to, to work with is self harm, um, and in Nuneaton and Bedworth, our, um, our primary mental health team are already working with the early help panel because it was recognised that we are seeing more in North Park, mm -hmm. in Nuneaton and Bedworth, North Russia. How can we try and support that? So they are working in particular with secondary schools um, to look at how we develop a resilience program, how we look at drop-ins, how we support the staff that are with the children and people six and a half hours of their day. So it, it, it's being recognised, but it's almost as if we do something come and it, we're always paddling because something else is coming up behind us um, with self-harm, which is, you know, we're saying it's a, it's a, a frightening national picture, isn't it? So, um, yeah. just, just a quick point on the self-harm, or, or two quick points. Obviously, some of the self-harm can be hidden. So actually, mm -hmm. if, if, if it's a major drug overdose, they end up in hospital. But a lot of it, it's whether they then, after they've done it, feel they need attention. And obviously, if services are moved to Coventry, <coughs> rather yeah. than being at the George Elliott, and, and it, it gets more of a, an ordeal to actually go and mm -hmm. present, is there a, a, a feeling of how much hidden self-harm and whether that's getting better or worse? Um, I think there'll always be hidden self-harm and, and self-harm can take um, takes presentation also in eating difficulties, young people can use eating as, as a form of self-harm, starving themselves, those sort of things. For me, from because I've been here while George Elliott had Katrina Ward and then we lost Katrina Ward, I don't think we've seen that as a massive impact because if young people do present, um, quite often it's via 999, the parents will call that, they, they will directly go to UHCW, I don't think that's necessarily change the impact but I, I also do think it will always be hidden but I also think it's less hidden and so it's, it's difficult because it's on both sides but we are seeing it talked about more and our colleagues in mind are, are doing the S word project which is particularly aimed at our higher end young people and sixth formers because actually it is something that needs to be talked about to recognise so I think we're seeing more because we're recognising it and it's less stigmatised to talk about but I am aware there'll always be a cohort of young people where it is is hidden and we need to get to that cohort of young people just as much as those that are saying so. And also you mentioned the school pressures and things. Mm -hmm. Obviously some children start school because it's an annual cut-off date. Is there any, and you've done the statistics, is there any statistics by month of birth to see whether it's sort of same throughout the year or whether actually the people who've gone to school effectively 12 months or 11 months earlier than the 
as well. Yeah. Yeah. But that'd be a good one to look at, wouldn't it? We were when we did this, we were we were really surprised because when we break it down at the end of the year, it's quite interesting to see it, it was particularly with Nuneaton and Bedworth. So it it's you know sometimes you have to have that data go in at the year to see actually was that just a one off or actually did it look the same in all areas. But I think you might be absolutely it'd be, it'd be good something to have a look at and, and break it down. So. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very briefly, two, two, just to pick up on two issues you've raised. Uh, first of all, in relation to uh, the disproportionate uh, number of girls who need uh, the, a service. I mean, that those numbers were huge, mm -hmm. and they were really increasing by thousands mm -hmm. per year. Uh, and you already picked up on cyberbullying, and I was going to mention cyberbullying. Uh, but also, I wonder, uh, I've got some friends who are head teachers and teachers, and uh, they talk to me about how shocking there are issues with sexting and, and pornography and things like that you don't really think about. Uh, but you know, these are really affecting our young people and their self-image or their expectations. And I just wonder how you, uh, tackle some of those issues uh, because they are, you know, they're safeguarding issues, but they're commonplace. Yeah. Uh, and you know, really, I'm I'm thinking about both this issue about how we as a local authority can help, and particularly help parents, but help the community mm -hmm. uh, to offer some support or to please things or uh, to offer some mechanism or strategy. Uh, and then second of all, I just wanted to pick up on a, an issue you mentioned about autism. Uh, I turned 35 in January, and only a few weeks after that, I read a paper that it was quite an extreme paper, and I think it was intended to be. I'm an academic, so, uh, and I read this paper, and it spoke about how people on the autistic spectrum, actually, their life expectancy can be as low as 36. Uh, and that's primarily because of people on the spectrum can often end their life as children. And uh, I'm not able explaining to you, which means, you know, if, you, if you've not got a, a particular condition or disability, you're, you're speaking about it, you know nothing of it. I'm actually autistic. So coming from my own experience of services and speaking to young people and children, I used to work at Connections, and so I had a lot of contact. One of the biggest issues that I experience with my young people and also myself, is often as an autistic, you can go and speak to a counsellor, you can be wanting to end your life because you really have no hope or, or for many other reasons, but you speak to the counsellor and the counsellor just sees a happy person mm -hmm. because you cannot display that. So first of all, I wondered how you were really looking to overcome that uh, and really recognising depression in autistic people. I think the tech service is excellent because when autistic people have autism shutdowns, they've actually got somewhere to go and speak to somebody when they can't communicate verbally. But I just wondered how you were managing to overcome that because a lot of uh, people on the spectrum will actually miss, you, you potentially could miss them because they won't ask for help. Um, and we, yeah, so the neurodevelopmental service obviously specialises in, in children and young people and adults with um, autism. And around some of that is around the training from the schools, which I mentioned earlier, and raising that awareness um, to make it, it's the subtleties that people don't always understand. Now, the people who are in the specialist mental health services do have training experience in working with people with autism as well, um, as will primary mental health services. But it, even to the level of like the GPs, for example, they don't they often miss. So some of this is going back to Michelle mentioned the dimensions tool, and the dimensions tool is a way. It's an information tool which is a web based um, tool, and it can help people to navigate care and navigate self help. Um, and it, or within that, it it will suggest whether a person needs an autism assessment, etc. If the, if it's required, but. It is about getting that awareness, I think, about autism out there a little bit more, um, because there are obviously a higher risk of mental health concerns. In, but I think it's about getting in there early, really, and helping them before they're at risk of going to mental health services. This is a bit of a two-pronged attack there. <coughs> so how could we as a local authority, do you think, because obviously we, we're a district authority, it's not to say we're limited in what we can do, we're really rooted in our community. 
What ways do you think we could help your services? Is there anything we could do, potentially in church or? Some of it is around encouraging schools because so I, I work predominantly in Coventry and Coventry schools have been very proactive in seeking support around autism. They have some schools have bought it, they've got their own autism specialists in there, but it feels particularly in Warwick, it doesn't feel as proactive with that. Um, and only recently the specialist teacher services have had somebody come over from Coventry now who is going to support, roll out the programme of the AET training. But to, to have that it's the momentum to want to find out more and it is does um, you know actually our referral rates for autism in Nuneaton or at or North Warwickshire are less than I would have expected um, so it, even though they feel really high and um, they were le less than comparable to Coventry and South Warwickshire so I think there is a, a lack of awareness there really. I think that that as a housing authority, you're a housing authority. Well, there's lots of other things, Nick, just do. <laughs> no, 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 no. You do bins too. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've got a local authority background, so I, I used to work in a, what used to be called a district authority as well as a okay. unity, so I was just double checking yeah, that. Yeah. 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 But, but <coughs> a lot of the debate, this kind of goes back to the earlier debate around kind of poverty and courses and what happens to families um, that get, for example, in housing difficulties and the impact of being in temporary accommodation, etc., and the impact on that child and the family in terms of their emotional health and well-being. So I think from a, from a housing authority perspective, I think there's probably a conversation that could be had in terms of thinking about things in the round, in terms of other things that can be done to kind of, um, for families, um, help them to not have too difficult an experience in relation to the housing market, in terms of the disruption to their lives of going to accommodation, and how that's managed and you know so there's stuff around housing I think and the impact that that has on people's lives that you'll be well placed to do from a planning perspective and the your licensing um, sort of I mean there, there's debate this is a kind of a, again a different angle um, is there's a lot of stuff around um, for example body image and all that kind of stuff so stuff in the, the broader public health agenda and using licensing powers to support um, healthier lifestyles, let's say. I can see your mind ticking there, thinking what services do districts provide? Mm -hmm. I know, I know. I, I know. I, I, it's complicated, isn't it? but we do provide leisure services, so you've hit on something. And that's another. So last time we came, there was somebody from your this department, and again, the healthy lifestyle stuff, he was talking about trying to improve engagement of a range of people, including young people, in some sports and other literary activities. And again, from a healthy lifestyle point of view, and thinking about uh, low level mental health difficulties, you know, it, there's evidence that if you, if you engage in activities, physical health activities, that can have a similar impact to IMAT, for example. So there's a range of things, if we think about the mental health agenda in the rounds, that you, you can contribute to in terms of um, helping to create an environment that is more what better for families, better for young people, definitely. And I think that there's also stuff around your staff um, that come into contact with families being trained and be able, being aware <coughs> of issues so that actually those messages where possible can, you know, making every contact can count in its broadest sense. So stuff around the awareness of your staff that come into contact with children, young people and families as well I think. So there's a, I do think there's a range of different things that, that in terms of the agenda you can contribute to as, as a local authority. And it's just a query. Do you have contacts with organisations like the Samaritans or the NSPCC? So if children actually contact them, um, is there any um, sort of feedback through those organisations to you? Um, less so with Samaritans. I think people generally see Samaritans as an adult um, uh, presentation. I mean, if they have a contact, NSPCC or the Bernardo's or same line, if they have contact and there's a safeguard number, they obviously follow their own. So if a young person's online and they say that you know they're going to go and kill themselves, mm -hmm. they follow their own processes and procedures. That often ends up then with the young person being safe, as in the, the, the police are sought, the, the ambulances are sought, and then we intervene at that point. Um, but certainly the conversations that we will need to have with the home treatment model and the crisis model I was referring to earlier is actually, how do we put that in? Because like Gemma's quite honestly, nearly half our young people that present on the wards are not known to us. 
So it might be that they have had conversations with a, a service like the same line or, or mental health matters, those sort of things. So I, think I, think I think in terms of Christ, this is kind of a bit of an extensive question. There is also a conversation about how can we create more opportunities for young people to access help. So we've talked about the community helps and the ability to drop in. Uh, in, in the adult world, there's conversations about crisis cafes, which, to be honest, uh, a lot of the conversations about, it sounds like it's um, adolescents so, and young adults that, that are more like to say, those kind of facilities. So there's something about actually if you're going through a crisis, and sometimes, and these are the experts, not me, sometimes a young person might be going through a relationship breakdown, it's a very specific issue. If, there's, if they've got somewhere they can go, <coughs> if they're, you know, the network's not working or whatever in terms of the friends, but if they've got somewhere they can go to talk to somebody, and actually talk it through, that might mean actually self-harm can be avoided. So there is something about thinking about a range of opportunities that might involve other organisations um, that can give them the opportunity to speak to somebody and talk things through. Um, so the adult service um, for Coventry and Warwickshire um, for, went live in December 2016. For, for North Warwickshire it went live in March, there was a slight delay. Um, but it came online because there was, it was identified from the Autism Act um, that you need the basic, there needed to be a service for the diagnosis of adults. So from there we have the um, Autism Strategy Board for Warwickshire, which I'm a board member. Um, and we were given the task of setting up a new service. First of all, we, uh, it was very clear that we didn't want to have a, just an ASD, an autism specific service, we wanted to have a neurodevelopmental service, acknowledging there's a high overlap between um, um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and dyspraxia as well. So I didn't want to just have one service go, oh sorry, we can't do the rest of you, <laughs> we just do one bit. So that was... Um, one of the things that came out from that. One of the um, concerns or issues that were raised at the time of developing a pathway was we do know there's about 1.1% of the population who may have autism. However, we didn't know how many of those had actually already been diagnosed. So we had no idea about the numbers. The only way we could um, base our numbers was on um, how many uh, spot purchases there had been. So um, CWPT, Cultural Warwickshire Partnership, <coughs> and made a, a number of uh, these spot purchasing from external um, agents, other NHS trusts for individuals who had said, I need an autism assessment. So those, I think, was a slight underestimation, but I did warn them at that point. So at that point, we didn't know what the numbers were going to be. Um, each CCG put in a pot of money, and we created a, a pathway, and through the pathway, actually North Warwickshire only came out of 47 assessments. So it's 47 people to come through a pathway um, for the service. So it's small um, from a North Warwickshire perspective. So uh, what we wanted to do was so provide this autism assessment pathway. We went out to some consultation with service users from, from individuals who have, who have got autism <coughs> um, and also some parents as well and other professionals, other, other services that have worked with um, adults with, um, with autism. First of all, we wanted to, it was very clear they didn't want a diagnostic only, an assessment only service because what they've said is, I had my assessment and then I fell off a cliff because nothing else happened and I didn't know what to do, I didn't know what that meant for me and I often got a leaflet given to me and that was all I had. Um, we also um, didn't want people to have to obviously now have to travel outside the areas because that's what they were having to do. We also um, wanted to make sure that we were a bespoke service so that we could offer bespoke advice because what was clear is that people with autism don't want to be necessarily referred to as having a mental health concern and they don't always have a learning disability and what was clear is there were people who were accessing mental health services who also happened to have ASD and there were also there were some people who were accessing a learning disability service who also had ASD as well. However there was a massive cohort of people who couldn't hit the criteria of either. 
they didn't have additional mental health and they didn't have a learning disability. So it was that population in particular that we were saying, right, there's a gap there, because all that's happening is we're waiting until they hit crisis point, because as we said earlier, they're at risk, higher risk of mental health concerns. We're waiting until they hit crisis point, then they're bang, they get into mental health services. So we were very clear to say we need to provide a service for those people that cannot access any other service at the moment. So that's why we started small. Um, so we wanted to make it, um, the idea was because the, small, the money was so small, uh, um, because we didn't know about the numbers, the GPs themselves wanted to have control over who, were, who was accessing the service so that they could have a, um, an understanding of the numbers going forward. So in a way, so we could quickly go back to them and say, oh, okay, we've, we've, there's too many, but you need to think about investing more money, for example, rather than a service holding and just getting inundated. So it's a, a currently um, a GP referral only service. Um, now that creates a bit of a problem. So for example, it's only for those people who turn up to their GPs because we know that not everybody with autism has got you know, the confidence or uh, the want or desire to go to their GP. Um, and some people would go to the GP and uh, would appear very sociable and actually the GP would say I don't know what you're talking about because you've just ticked some questions and actually you don't look autistic or whatever that means. So we, we knew a few barriers there. Um, so what we wanted to do is, um, so yes, yeah, so the so GP referral only, um, but we have a, a multidisciplinary team. So we have psychologists, we have occupational therapists and speech and language therapy. Um, and a wonderful admin person, I have to mention. So the, the GP refers in, they have to complete um, an AQ10, which is a, an autism quotient questionnaire, um, in order for us to just get an idea that they've made the right decision around referring in. Um, we then um, do the assessment. Uh, then after the assessment, um, we provide predominantly a psychoeducation sessions. Now, we've gone through a lot of learning the last 12 months about what, because we've kind of, we set, set off saying it was going to be more about education, about what does autism mean for you, uh, looking at your communication style, your sensory difficulties, and how you regulate your own emotions. So we knew that was going to be a layer. What's becoming quite clear as we've moved through the last year is um, a lot of the individuals coming through have needed support with education and employment and navigating that world and making reasonable adjustments. Uh, they've had an awful lot of benefit from just having the confirmation that that is what's going on for them, uh, that they may have autism or they do have autism. Um, it's almost about reframing their life for them and reframing the, the things that they found challenging. Um, we are, so the occupational therapist is doing a lot more um, work around that accessibility um, to, to work and in education. They're also doing, we've found uh, there's a high incidence of dyspraxia, so coordination difficulties in this population, which we knew anyway. Um, but again, a lot of the people have come through that so said, I didn't even think about that, but that actually now you've told me about it, it makes a lot of sense and um, it's had a massive impact on my life. Um, so the, the post-diagnostic work is, is, is one of the most important things. When a person's coming through an assessment at the point of giving them the diagnosis, uh, the, a lot of the work is done at that point about helping them to understand that, what that means to them. We also have a lot of the families come in, the parents, the, the siblings, we've got, we've got um, wives, husbands have come in and sat in the sessions and to understand for them as well what this means for their, their significant other. So those are just the pathways, basically, for ASD and ADHD. An ADHD assessment um, also involves a psychiatrist. Um, at the moment, um, we do obviously provide some medication, but around, again, a lot of it is around psychoeducation and helping them to understand what that means to them and how to manage their symptoms and what to do, so it's not just reliant on, on medication. Um, so we did um, a, an evaluation in September, which was really enlightening um, because we held a focus group and we also did some telephone um, um, surveys and questionnaires. And I have to say, it was overwhelmingly positive. 
the, uh, so many of the, the stories that were given are life changing and it can't be underestimated how significant this is for so many of these individuals. These are people who have, you know, we had one gentleman who was a, a lecturer at a university who, you know, can say, I can present to 500 people, but then I go behind the, the screens and I have to start self-stimming and flapping. But to have, for him to have confirmation for him, for himself, was life-changing. Um, so the, some really powerful um, feedback we have from the focus group. We also, every session we do, we get feedback, and this is the, the satisfaction that we're getting from people. Um, really valued service at uh, people who are coming through saying what can I do to promote you what can I do to ensure this is going to stay how can we get more people so um, obviously the the difficulties at the moment is that we uh, we were only funded for 47 people and we've actually had double the amount of referrals <coughs> so it needs to it does need to get bigger but we don't know how many people we haven't already touched and had who still need it out there and also potentially being able to widen the referral criteria so it's not just GP. We also know that at the moment some people who are, um, one of the criteria for us is that we're not able to see people who are open to mental health services, because partly because their predominant need at that time is a mental health concern, and actually some people who are through in mental health services, they're not well enough to go through an assessment and they're not in the right place to access that. So the idea would be that they receive their intervention in mental health and when they are well enough, they can then access our service. However, there's, there's some, some consideration there about actually whether mental health uh, colleagues can start to do some more assessments, but that's a training need. And in other localities, so there's a, a couple of uh, centres in Bristol and Northampton, they um, have very clearly have a neurodevelopmental service, but they work with their mental health colleagues to provide training and expertise to, to consult with them to provide diagnosis while people are in mental health services. But the, we wanted to have a 12 month trial of what comes through the door, what do we need to do, get this right, and then work and broaden it out and work with our commissioners to make it wider. That's it. Thank you, it sounds really, really positive. Um, first question is, you use the AQ10, yes. which um, if you have a look at that online, it's quite male-centric. It is. One of the questions um, you have to tick being, I like to collect information about categories of things, e.g. types of trains. So what, like, what my question is, do you have figures of how many males and how many females have come through and the results? Yes. So first of all, I did try and push back about the AQ10, but it's in the NICE guidance. So the GP wanted to use something. However, we do accept referrals that are more narrative and we don't want them just to do the AQ10. They have AQ10. The GP would want some explanation around that because we are aware that somebody would go in and this is what we were saying at the beginning, personal autism will say what, exactly what you want to hear and actually may be missed. In terms of male to female, we're about 50-50, which is really positive. It's one of the best things that I think has come out, and we're having many ladies who are coming through, um, often parents of the children. Um, so that is one of the, the definite successes, is that we're, we're reaching the ladies. Um, and the AQ10 is kind of tokenistic in my, my mind, sorry. <laughs> yeah, because there's limitations. And, and with, with that, um, I don't know when they, they all do it, there's the empathy um, question yes. as well, yes. which um, I wonder why that's in there. Right, so they do the triple A um, as part of the uh, initial diagnostic. They do it because it's got some evidence base. We don't, we're we lacking in tools for adults. We've got quite a lot in the children's services, but not so much for the adults. So that's the only one that have got any evidence base around. However, I have to reiterate that the clinicians are all very experienced and they are highly skilled and trained in the diagnostic. So they would never rely on a diagnostic tool. It's just what they do is developmental history. They meet with the patient. They talk for a good length of time to understand that person. It is never based on just a tick box exercise. I absolutely reassure you of that. But okay. yeah. Okay. And um, lastly, um, with the link with 
training in schools um, because as, as you say a lot of the um, parents whose children are going through recognising themselves um, but um, on a very regular basis those of us that work in schools and colleges hear very very negative um, comments about parents of children um, I've, I've written one down here the, the last one I heard um, if he could meet his mum Trish you would understand why little Johnny struggles to fit in his mum is as mad as a box of frogs complete nutter um, and I hear things like that and in, in all sorts of different schools about parents so it's that lack of awareness and yeah. a massive need for education and um, that was a Senko that said that by the way not just a um, receptionist or you know uh, one, one of the things we, we've had quite a few conversations recently is about um, the amount of parents who access the children's neurodevelopmental service who also have their own neurodevelopmental disorders and they find it so hard to access some of the support and actually put into place things that we're recommending and it's about how we help parents not only the neuro but their mental health as well because we know that we expect we expect a lot from the parents we expect them to put in place recommendations and go home and sit on a course and then go home and implement it but actually it's the parents that <laughs> often need that, <coughs> that support more than the child. It goes back to the point that, that I know we've talked about schools and the understanding, confidence, capability, awareness of mental health issues and their ability to respond in a positive way. And I think that's a fundamental bit of the, the picture. The other thing, I mean, in terms of our pathways that we've got, I don't think we've got a pathway called Madness of Box of Frogs yet. <laughs> but we'll, 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 look, we'll, we'll see if there's more that needs development, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I asked this item to come here, and originally there's been a, a great deal of progress with this service, and I wanted to highlight the work you're doing. Uh, originally, a number of years ago, I actually <coughs> wanted to have an autistic diagnosis. It runs in the family, and a colleague had uh, suggested it might be good to have a look. And uh, I was also undertaking a PhD and so I had found out I was dyspraxic, okay. I'm quite severely dyspraxic, so I've had a number of tests, uh, and I'm dyslexic. And so I wanted to look at autism. And when I went to the GP, there was no service to refer me to at that point. And I argued with the CCG, not just for me, but for others, about getting a service. And then we got a service, and I thought, well, it's going to be a reduced service that's not very good, and, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be like so much else it's, it's going to be there but it's, it's not going to be accessible and actually I've been blown away by the service it's been fantastic uh, it turns out that I actually also have ADHD uh, so I'm collecting all the letters that I didn't want to collect I just wanted to collect PhD I've ended up with ADHD but you've highlighted I wanted to ask how uh, we could create more inclusive communities and also in providing our services to the community how we can think about people with autism, ADHD and, and, and neurodiversity. Uh, as a politician, <coughs> I find politics incredibly hard uh, and you know my colleagues I sometimes rub them up the wrong way quite often uh, but also I am very sensitive and I'm very caring and I can be quite innovative and creative but at the same time uh, there's lots of traits that don't work so well in a neurotypical world. And so if we apply that to us as a council, I'd be interested in knowing how we could adopt or develop our council services because obviously people get a diagnosis. And my GP wasn't sure whether I really, whether anybody really needed one. And what's the point as an adult? But it helps me understand better who I am and what I can cope with. And it means I don't have autistic <coughs> shutdowns for long periods of time or you know, when I go and speak to lots of people afterwards I just can't speak to anybody uh, but how can we as a council support people who've gone on this journey to then access services here uh, you know whether it's council tax or whether it's housing or other issues because they may be struggling uh, and also uh, really the topic that's come up this evening is about how we can and I'll be moving a recommendation that we as an authority seek to somehow voice our own concern about the 
ending of the service or potential end and that we really want it to extend because you know anybody who needs or wants a diagnosis should be able to get one uh, and I, I just passionately believe it's really important because it transforms people's lives it, it helps them understand the relationships they've had uh, it helps them develop their careers and often people aren't as lucky as me I you know run businesses, I had a minister in the Church of England and I'm now an academic. I probably fit in more as an academic than I have anywhere else, uh, which is just an autistic thing. But <coughs> I think that we do need this service desperately because it helps people understand who they are and they're able then to play a, a more productive part in the community. Uh, and I also think that we as a council chair need to look at how we can develop our services, so we're an autistic friendly borough. And I'm not moving that we say we want to be an autistic friendly borough this evening, but if we could look at that in the future going forward, that would be really positive, and I know colleagues have been pushing for that. Yeah, on uh, the, uh, the Autism Strategy Board for last year, we've been uh, <coughs> discussing autism champions. So in Coventry we had that, where there was police, fire service, education, employment services, all sat around the table, and there was some training from the um, West Midland, Autism West Midlands to be <coughs> autism champions. So that it, was, it was trying to sp spread it out there and having you know autistic friendly libraries and days that you can go into Asda and things like that. So it is, that could be a, a potential. Um, and the other part is just about <coughs> continuing the service, but also ha allowing it to to possibly develop because we don't uh, uh, we can't provide intervention for people who have already had a diagnosis, and that's a, a real limit. There, it has to you know there's there's, there's more that's needed for intervention around it. How does how does that work then? If if a child has been diagnosed, mm -hmm. and let's say they potentially had a care package with social services for a while, and then you know they went on to be fully functioning adults for a while really successful went to university got a really good job and whatever and then had an autistic shutdown or their relationship broke down or whatever and their autism effectively sort of impacted on their function what what then happens to that individual what they possibly end up in mental health services unfortunately mm -hmm. um, and whether that's appropriate or not isn't a discussion um, or with social care if because we have in a lot of um, adults who have lived with their parents and then the parents pass away and then that's when there's a cry it's usually a crisis point and that's where we need to stop re responding to crisis and just help people who have just it's their autism it's not mental health it's not anything else it's their it's, that's the bit they need the support with there's a gap there is reality uh, thank you Jill. <laughs> um it may it may <coughs> seem a small thing but we we, we talk about um autistic people, autistic children. Um, I'd like to see more, and I've heard it today, of us talking about children with autism. Mm -hmm. we're, we're defining the person by the condition. Um, we're all people with something, I think we've, we've agreed on that. Most of us would not want to be defined by the something, but we're all people. And if we, if we come more to using the phrase people with, mm -hmm rather than of the autism. Uh, same for children with, with Downs, if we refer yeah. to them in that sort of way and, and, and see them in that sort of way, or hopefully we will see them in that sort of way. They're all very unique, so thank you for making that point. I like the inclusive communities mm -hmm. comment because I think whether, arguably, whether somebody's diagnosed or not, there is something about how we create communities and facilities that are as inclusive <coughs> as they can be for people. And I think there is something about how, you know, thinking about what that looks like and how to take that forward. So I do like that concept. Of, but how we do it is, is, is not straightforward, but I do like the idea of that as a general concept, definitely. You said you're autism, Luke? Yeah, Sheriff. I'm sorry, just jumped in ahead Go on. Sorry. Can I just uh, respond? I hear that quite a lot, Margaret. Um, there is a um, big push in the autistic community um, to be known as autistic rather than a person with autism. It's kind of like being known as a person with femaleness. Um, it's, it's, it's not a, um, something you catch or you, you have. It's just part of you. 
Um, so, so there is the, um, the, the backlash to to that comment that uh, just just prefer to be called autistic. Um, so, so it's very it's all so a lot. Of it. It's very individual. There's a lot of people yeah. that don't want it to be called a disorder. It's a rather yeah, different. Condition. You use the word neurodiversity, and there's a lot of those kind of movements around. So it's it's actually each individual has a very different perspective and how they how they view themselves and how they want to be. Yes, Chair. Uh, I've forgotten now. Because <laughs> uh, it's quite a controversial debate. I prefer autistic person, but others don't. And I think it's about the individual, and it's, 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 a, it's a developing area. Uh, I just prefer no, neurodiversity, really. Uh, the Chair, the recommendation <laughs> is that, uh, that we take some of what we've discussed today the other issues, but also this, and we look to whether we can develop our services and our community to become more inclusive uh, of neurodiversity. And if we if we make that recommendation to the cabinet officers to look at whether there's something we could do, it could be a motion to full council to do something, it could be just looking at our services. It may already be happening, but it's just about keeping it there in the forefront of our minds and thinking, well, OK, we're developing this service. What about other people's requirements? And we do that both with dementia and with other issues, and we need to do it with neurodiversity too. We have very vocal service users who would be very and very articulate, who would be very willing to do anything and be a voice of the service. Got something to add to your recommendation, you'd be happy for me to do that. And <coughs> Continue funding to the adult users because actually it's not now really in public then. Happy with that, Chair. More than happy. Anybody else willing to second? Second. All those in favour, please Against? Abstention. Because you're on the county council. No. No. No, but just. Because you're on one of the boards on you, so I just wasn't sure. Conflict of interest. So, if, and thank you very much, you ten. It's been very informative. Okay, you know, and if we can ask you to come back midway through your the love of the time and stay, there, because that's it, the use of self, things are progressing, things will go that might have gone after the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want to eight and ten. There's on the and the STP, better care, better value, better health. In regards to Andy Hardy, the meeting, he will not be attending the meeting on the 15th of March. He has decided he's going to London instead, even though it was the date he put now down, he's not his way around. So I have wrote to Mr. Jim to ask him to bear the dose and they are disappointed we are. This is the second time that he's not been done. Can I suggest if we never get him, we actually ask him to send a deputy? Because otherwise, I've, I've asked that already. Okay, Chair, can we can we make sure that we, as a committee, collectively voice our disappointment uh, on behalf of the people that we represent? <coughs> because he has a duty to come before us as representatives of local people and give an explanation to the public as well. Uh, about these plans because they've been hidden for far too long and they're causing much concern among residents. <coughs> uh, and we really need to hear about what the plans are and to scrutinise them and hold him and others to account. And we're not able to, and it's not acceptable. Chair? Just on that point, Andrew Hardy was on the radio <coughs> in the newspaper review and all sorts of puff pieces where he's not subject to any hard questions. So. Yeah. We need to call him. I know, the, I know the public are very interested in attending. I've had four or five people contact me in regards to the dates. I'm disappointed to have to say to them, I'm sorry he's not coming again, which is why I'm doing it. So I will keep them updated. I'm hoping I gave him the dates, I believe, from Wednesday that he can't do any dates in March, but we'll ask for April. And I live in hope. As long as it's not April the first. <laughs> <laughs> so we 
moving on to item 11, I just spoke with Ian Pelver, SC, and the last meeting I attended, it was around the discharge protocol that was actually coming to this committee, at the next meeting. Um, we had the Judge Ellis Hospital are doing better than South Warwickshire and Tom Trimble, did it in that regard, but not, not good enough. I have got slides if any member has let in, but I have a feeling the slides will be coming again in March. So if anybody wants me to pass the slides on to Matt and do that, that's the consequence. Yeah, yeah, we get weekly reports over the winter about the winter situation, and that's got so bad they're down to like one bed some days at UHCW. So the, the discharge is absolutely critical, and so I would like to see those slides uh, because it is all part of the process, as we saw with the. Um, hospice at home and things. Anything we can do to actually make sure our hospitals work with a tiny little bit of spare capacity, um, the better. Item 12, the forward plan shouldn't have been on there because it comes in March because this is a special meeting. The work programme has amended. Um, there is four items on the WAVE programme. Um, teenage perception update, the JS and I public health update, the suicide prevention strategy, <coughs> and the HWBB annual report. Which are all, all sit in the hands of the county. Um, Shirley and I have been discussions with them when Shirley back from the holidays in terms of timings because. They keep saying it's not ready yet, it's not ready yet, there's an issue with. So I'll be looking at that and sharing for my holidays. I think given the cabinet meeting which was suggesting we cut the scrutiny panels in half, this co committee's done an awful lot of good work since it was separated off. There is so much in health that I think we need to actually discuss at the next meeting continuing with health scrutiny as an independent scrutiny panel. I think it was a budgetary decision to, to because there's four chairs at four and a half thousand pounds each to change the scrutiny. But I think we actually do need a health scrutiny committee because there's so much to do on health, particularly with the STP coming through, that I cannot even if someone shared it without being paid, I think it's better to keep the health scrutiny going because it does a, a valuable job and it's the only scrutiny panel we've got that scrutinizes all the external providers. So it, it, it is a special and unique and important role we do. So, will you do me a favour and put that in a work programme item for me, the past, and then you can look at it when she comes back. Okay. So all the other things that will be covered in the March meeting, I don't want members to look at this big long list and think we'll be some of my son in March, because there's a lot of things that we've moved across, obviously, to try and but the, the four items there I'll be discussing with Shirley when she comes back because they belong to public health and they are not coming back with the information we need for dates. I've not received any other items. So I can thank the members for the time. Okay. The, next, the next meeting is the 15th of March.